Or down. Testing one, two, three, four, five. We're here at the Rogers Center for Game Changer Eight. Tonight, the Toronto Blue Jays take on the Minnesota Twins. Last night, the Toronto Blue Jays lost. Okay, I. Give that to the speaker, please. I don't know who's speaking first. Uh, call me JP. The best to give it to. JP, this is for you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, people thought I was going to be the next Greg Carrasco, so I had to kind of remove myself from the situation and make it about the store. Sure, sure. Uh, and I don't have the budget Greg Ed does. I've got like, I don't even have Greg's shoe budget. <laughs> so He likes his shoes, does he? He likes his shoes. They're fucking expensive. He imports them from somewhere in Portugal that some child died making them. While being with the hooker. <laughs> He's got a story. He's got yeah, it's got to be a story. <laughs> oh, Timmy, make the shoes. Uh, that's, that's great. I was like, I was like what, you guys are picking up? Yeah, we're, uh, we're moving offices tomorrow. I know. Oh, wow. Now, Warren's yeah. coming too. So yeah, is, uh, so is that Hagel moving at the same time? Yeah. Well, they're kind of, Everything. well, you kicked that Hagel out of the office. You <laughs> I know, yeah. I'm they're working at home, home now, and, and Warren's so disappointed. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Warren loves it. I know. Uh, yeah, everything. We're basically outgrown our office now. Wow. Yeah. I, I can't even book a meeting room to do that. Where are you guys? So, you guys can come and do my my uh, my networking show. You're right across the street, yeah. 600 Bay Street. Yeah. So that, that's where I film, yeah. It's a creepy old place. Looks like you know very, someone. Very it looks like a CBC building that was built that that was uh, it's supposed to be run, run down and broken down in about three years ago. But hey, what the hell? Uh, I try to do it weekly. I haven't. I, I recorded eight episodes, so I didn't have to do it weekly. So.
What about? <laughs> Come on, just do it for me. How much friendly will you be? Test, test, test. It's got quiet all of a sudden. Hmm? Play with my pocket, everyone got quiet. <laughs> well, expecting something good. You should not expect that. <laughs> all I am is loud. That's all I got. Am I turned on, Niall? <laughs> Niall, am I turned on? Am I good? Okay. Everybody, welcome to the Game Changer. How's everybody doing? That sucked. How's everybody doing? That was very sucked. Yeah. So my name is JP Osagi. I am the MC for the event. If you don't like me, that is Jason's fault. Uh, today we're going to be we really, really lucky. Uh, we've got some amazing speakers. Uh, first of all, let's give it up for uh, Jason's crew. This wouldn't have happened without them. So, guys, thank you. Cameraman, mic guys, the guy who touched my bum. You know who you are, right? Um, we've got uh, Barry Hillier here. He is a wealth of knowledge when it comes to entrepreneurship, uh, AI, marketing, and of course, Sean Kelly. John Kelly is the car biz coach. He came all the way from St. Louis, right? So he is a wealth of knowledge. He will rack your brain with some ideas and better ideas to improve your business, right? Of course, we have Jason Harris, Mr. Miss, Miss, or I like to call him when he calls me, Mr. Neil Wallace from Pulp Fiction. I don't know why, just don't know why. Anyway, the, uh, the benefit today, you're gonna have a lot of knowledge. We're gonna have a lot of fun. The Blue Jays, I, I know we're gonna win tonight. Because last two nights they sucked. Um, and if anyone didn't know, anyone doesn't see, there is a shattered window there. That was from a home run. Was it hit by the Blue Jays? No. Okay. <laughs> it was a bunt gun bag. Um, so the whole idea of today is to give you the knowledge so you can go back to your lives and your dealerships and make more money, make more customers happy, and grow, right? Um, a little bit about me and a little bit about my history. Come on in. Um, I've been in the car business for about a decade, maybe a little more than a decade now, 12 years. Uh, I used to be a stand-up comedian. Uh, you're going to figure that out lately, soon. Uh, I was a professional bass fisherman. I lived in my truck and drove around the U.S. It was very painful. Uh, you, you learn to be poor as a professional bass fisherman. It sounds like an elegant lifestyle, like a professional golfer, but not so much. Uh, I fell in the car business uh, many years ago and uh, kind of woke up in Toronto. I started in Ottawa. And did well, and then the guy who hired me in Ottawa moved to Toronto, and I woke up in his trunk. And here I am. Now I am the GM of Stovall Nissan. Uh, I'm a trainer, and I help entrepreneurs with networking. So that's a little bit more about me. Your first speaker of the night is Barry Hillier. Barry is, we're really lucky to have him. He's usually not available. And uh, he's worked with amazing companies. He's got over eight years of advertising just to start, just in advertising and marketing. He's worked with Wrigley's, ING Direct, Toyota, H&R Block, Kraft, Atlantic Lottery Corp. I'm coming to see you later. <laughs> um, LCBO, I'm definitely going to come see you later. All right. He has had his hands in so much in and out of the automotive business. The guy is a breath of fresh air in the knowledge, and he's very articulate. You're going to enjoy this. Currently, he has EQ. Did I say it right? EQUO. Um, Equo is an, basically a technology that helps entrepreneurs find what they would want to learn worldwide. So Barry's going to come up in a second. Barry is a really articulate speaker, and he's going to have a good time. But first, we're going to try something. Who's on LinkedIn? Raise your hand. Okay, everyone take out their phone. Some of you have done this before. All right. I believe that everyone shares knowledge together. The community grows faster together. So everyone open their LinkedIn. All right. Go to your home page. Right there. See the little guys at the bottom of the screen? That's two little guys. On your, when you're logged in, the two little guys there. Right there. Click that. At the very top of your screen, it says find nearby. See that? Find nearby. And now you'll see everyone populate. 
Now you can actually market and become in their network. So you can actually uh, find nearby. Everyone got that? Any questions? Everyone's populating. Wi-Fi sucks here. A little slow. Find nearby. And if you're on and you're logged in, it'll actually show everyone in the network. Yeah, you have to enable it. So right now I'm on it. No one else is. Um, did you find it? Find nearby. So go back. Yeah, you got it. So you can actually join everyone on the network. There it is. So I'm just going to start adding people. Now you have a wealth of knowledge of people in the industry, people you work with, people who are your competitors, people who are your friends, people who you walk away, the trainers of the day, myself, Jason, Jason's crew. You have all this knowledge. And you also, if you ever go to a trade show and you want to look like a superstar, do that. <laughs> you look like a god. All right? Um, how many people in, in the room network? Okay. What does the word networking mean? Make friends. Make friends. Well, it's, it's good. It's make relationships that don't revolve around you. Right? You have to make sure that you, when networking, it's about the community. You grow faster as a community and the community grow faster together. Don't be a business card ninja when you're networking. You know, you ever know what that is? Someone who flies in by night, you have a business card in your hand and you didn't know how it got there and the guy is gone. Or a business card Santa where he comes and delivers business cards and he's off to the next networking event. Right? Don't do that. Um, have, try to have, with tonight, you'll float around the room and talk to a lot of people. Try to have really deep conversations with one or two people, get everyone else's contact information and follow up. That's the power of networking. If you try to have deep conversations with everyone in the room, you'll probably find it'll be difficult, all right? Just try to focus on a couple people, talk to them, get to know them, enjoy the evening. Otherwise, without further ado, barrier up. We're doing a quick mic change. Slight mic change. So Slight mic change. Can you use it yourself? It's been against me. <laughs> that working? I'm a sound guy. I'll assume. Okay. So thank you. Uh, just to give everybody a quick introduction. So I started in advertising and marketing in 1992. Uh, worked for some of the larger agencies, Saatchi and Saatchi, BBDO, Communique. I ran uh, half of Microsoft Canada uh, in the 90s uh, at one point. And the reason why I'm telling this, I'm going to be talking about disruption. And my entire career has been disrupted. Because when I first started in advertising, there wasn't the internet. There was no such thing as Amazon. You sure as hell didn't have bots and AI and all of the stuff that's come to completely change our lives. You didn't have any of these cell phone things. You had none of that. I remember when I got my first email address. And over the period of my career, what ended up happening is a whole world change. All of a sudden, traditional advertising was, oh, what's that? Why are you still doing that? Everything was digital. Then it was social media. Then it was SaaS-based products. And all of a sudden, everything completely turned on its head. Some people did really well. Some people kept up with it. Some people created companies with it. Some people were able to create incredible careers with it. And other people found themselves on the outside. I've got so many people that I started out with in the very early days that right now should be at the peak, late 40s. When I started in advertising, you're at the peak in advertising. You were making great money. You're working on the best projects. You had, if you were good, the entire world in front of you. What ended up happening, half of those people that are incredibly talented, they can't find a job. 
They didn't stick around in terms of understanding what was happening with all of these changes, and, and it dramatically impacted them. So what happened for me was in the late 90s, I ended up going to a dot-com company, helped uh, that company IPO, and that was my first foray into really disruptive technology being the beginning of the internet. We didn't have UI experts, we just did what we needed to do. There were no such thing as, as half of what you have right now in terms of data engineers, software engineers. It was, what do we need to do? Get a piece of paper, let's figure out how the hell you do it, and it was the wild, wild west, and you just figured it out. And if you didn't figure it out, then you hoped somebody else would figure it out with you. And you made mistakes along the way. So we ended up IP own, uh, owing the company, and in 2001, I started my first company, which is called Dashboard, it was a digital ad agency. And the whole premise was, I recognized in the marketplace you had traditional agencies that didn't know what the hell digital was, and then you had digital agencies that tended to be focused on technology, and they had a belief of bullshit baffles brains. I'm just gonna confuse you with all of this stuff till you think you can't do it, and I'm gonna protect my job. So I took more of an approach of, we're going to figure out how to utilize technology to strategically build the business. And that was the focus of the dashboard, how to connect with the brand, how to connect with the consumer, how to help build out from a business standpoint your goals and do it in a way that was going to set you aside from the competition. So progressed and progressed. Then, wow, another disruption. What the fuck is this social media? What is this mobile thing? All this stuff was starting to hit. So you had to stay on top. And I'm thinking in the early days, between 2001 and 2007, we were one of the top creative boutiques. We were listed as one of the top five flash development shops in Canada. That was before Steve Jobs killed it. Okay, So in that short window of time, think of how much had happened from all of a sudden websites to suddenly all of a sudden we've got apps and we've got all of these other things hitting. Facebook coming up, this coming up. Even the people that were at the forefront seven years ago were falling behind, and you had all the segmentation. Then the market crash hit. And at the end of the market crash, one of the things that had happened early on, we did work for ING Direct, we did work for Unilever, we did work for Wrigley's, but 2001, one of my biggest early clients was the Ontario Toyota Dealers uh, Association. And I ended up doing a lot of work with them. Then I did work with Toyota directly, and I loved it. I really, really enjoyed actually working within the automotive industry. After the market crash, Toyota said, we're not providing websites. They were using a company called Devlin. They, were, they provided the CMS, a CNOD, and they just said, we're out of it. So some dealers came to me. It was actually uh, uh, some of the key people that were on the uh, board for the interior Toyota dealers, and they said, hey, you do all this web stuff. Can't you just build us a web system? I'm an entrepreneur. Yeah, of course I can. So we spent a year and we organized, we put together our first content management system, first foray into being a SaaS company. Didn't know what SaaS was at the time. But essentially, you're building WordPress before WordPress existed. So again, another major disruption. Started out in traditional advertising, got into digital advertising, then got into SaaS-based software development. Things progressed. All of a sudden, when I worked in the late 90s, and I put together the first integrated digital strategy for the Vancouver Canucks, get ready to hear the budget. $1.1 million. $1.1 million. Because back then, if you were to put together a traditional web page, you know, we were selling some of those for $75,000, $100,000. Things progressed, and then suddenly by around 2005, the average web budget that I had was between $100,000 and $250,000. Well, then Wix com comes along and all these other companies, WordPress comes along, major disruption. Why the hell am I going to pay you that when I can pick this up for like next to nothing? It became commoditized. So I needed to shift. So I started getting more into SaaS-based development, and that's then when I worked with Steve uh, Southern, and we started to create Bumper. All these things started to progress. I ended up selling all of the companies in 2017, and I was, I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do next, and I was reflecting on my own history. My history was one 
not just disruption, but also recognizing that it's very hard to find the right people, find the right resources that you need to succeed. And you just always feel like you're kind of all alone. So what I ended up creating was a company that we're going to be launching actually in the next couple of months called Equo. It's a distributed marketplace set up for entrepreneurs and talent to access financial capital, human capital, and other resources. The point, though, of telling you that story is I faced in the last, well, since 1992, so 20-some-odd years of my professional life with disruption after disruption after disruption. And that's what you guys are also facing. That's what I, I, I really want to spend a bit of time talking about. Okay, we're going to do it this way. Is that going? Is it turned on? This is a disruption. What's going on? Yeah, just get this. You take it off. Yeah. This is live. Yeah, this is live. <laughs> Sorry, guys, talking about disruption. <laughs> okay. So in looking right now, I, I just want to do a, a quick shout out. What industries right now do you think are ripe for disruption? Just throw out. Automotive. Definitely. Any others? Insurance. Real estate. What is it about that that, is, that you look at and you go, Jesus Christ, somebody's going to do that better? Come on. Technology. Technology? Technology. Yeah. S sitting down, and when, when you take a look at what's happened, there are a lot of industries, and so you know all of this. I'm going to go over some stuff hopefully you don't know, but Apple completely disrupted the music industry. iPod, iTunes, all of those came in. They fought it left, right, and center. Left, right, and center. Do you, do you remember the Metallica drummer talking about screw song sharing? He didn't win that puppy. You've got Uber. Okay. I'll tell you why I take Ubers and not taxis. They smell like shit. The drivers are rude. They're hard to get a, a, a hold of. They weren't paying attention to what the market needed. They weren't paying attention to technology. They weren't doing what they needed to do to keep me as a customer happy and satisfied. You've got Netflix. Blockbuster inspired Netflix. You guys all know the story. Netflix owners walked into Blockbuster, were pissed off that they had to pay a $10 late fee, said, fuck this, and they started Netflix. Then they had the chance to buy Netflix for 25 million and Blockbuster couldn't see it. So they're gone. You've got Amazon right there. Right now, about 25 cents of every retail dollar is going to Amazon globally. That's crazy. Who saw that? How much did that get affected? Now, I haven't been involved. I'll, I'll tell you, I love automotive. I love my auto fam. I've been out of it for about a couple of years. I really, truly love the people. I hate the attitude. Because I just find it doesn't change. It's the same fucking conversation over and over and over again. It's the same people saying the same things, yet it doesn't change. When it's going to change is when somebody sidebars you. So what I wanted to do, for those of you who, Brent Weiss was my former business partner. Great guy. Really close. He tended to be more in the, 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 the forefront than me, because he's better looking and better spoken and all of that stuff. So I actually asked him, I showed him my, my presentation. He said, look, these guys are hearing about disruption all the time. Don't tell them about disruption. Help them figure out what to do with it. So that's what I'm going to try and spend a little bit of time on. So I'm going to start, though, with some, some facts to try and make you hopefully feel a little bit better. I'm a Battlestar Galactica fan. So for those of you who happen to be fans, you'll get this. This has happened before. It will happen again. Uh, but if I sit down and take a look and try not to block things here, since 2000, 52% of Fortune 500 companies are either bankrupt or they cease to exist. 
Yeah. Think that since 2000, that's insane. 55% of executives believe that their biggest future competition in the next two years is going to come from outside of the industry. 42 believe it's going to be new digital market entrants, but 13% are going to be non-digital. So it's not just digital. It's people actually thinking about different and innovative ways to change the processes and what's happening. And the one biggest issue that I'm going to keep emphasizing Go to things like Game Changer, because this is fabulous, but don't only go to the automotive events, because groupthink is settling in. And, and you want to be able to see what's coming in. So attending things like Collision that's coming up would be a great thing for you guys to grab some tickets for. Only 31% of executives are actively responding to industry disruption. So 70%, almost 70% of executives out there aren't even looking at what could be potentially disrupting their industry. 85% of the top execs believe their organizations promote collaboration internally, but only 41% of their employees agreed. And I'll, I'll share this, by the way. Anybody who wants it, uh, I'll, just, I'll hand you the deck as well. 51% of employees are looking for a new job. And you guys have a harder time, and I know you guys have a harder time getting really good staff. So you're not competing with other dealers. You're competing with everybody else out there. We're going to talk a lot about that as well. 89% of companies expect to compete mostly on the basis of customer service versus 36% four years ago. So customer service, not your product, not anything else, that's really what's going to start to differentiate you. 94% of categories have had huge swings in brand loyalty ratings over the last year. With 57%, they've had a change in loyalty. So I love Toyota. I started my automotive career working with Toyota. Great brand. Doesn't mean what it used to mean. How safe do you feel right now that your brand loyalty is going to keep getting you by? I can't tell you how many times I saw a Hyundai on the road in the early days when Genesis came out, and I thought that was a luxury car. Because the design was just so awesome. How safe do you feel in terms of the product that you're selling being a real differentiator anymore? And if you really feel that your product's that much of a differentiator, you're kidding yourself. So how special is your dealership? So there's certain parameters of difference. So how many people will agree to this statement in your dealership? You guys are community driven or focused. Raise your hands. How many of you, the customer comes first? How many of you are family owned? 30 years, 25 years, oh my god, fourth generation, yeah. How many of you, it's our dedicated team. We got a dedicated team. How many of you, Best trained technicians. You don't want to take this to somebody who doesn't understand your car. Why would you do that? We got the best prices. Nobody, trust me, come to me. I'm going to make sure you get the best price. Oh, and by the way, no haggling. You don't need to haggle for it. I'm, we're going to give you the best price. We're honest. We're really honest. Those guys, they're not honest. We're honest. We're committed. We're committed. We're committed to you. We're committed to this relationship. We're committed to having you over the long haul. We're committed. Satisfaction guaranteed. How familiar does that sound? Because you all say the same thing. You do. There's nothing that separates you, and you're going to lose your best employee to the dealership down the road, or you're going to lose your best employee who's gone on into another industry. Okay, so what are we going to do about it? So I want to start to look at what's been happening. It's been a big evolution. It's going to continue to change. The next five years, if you think the last 30 were crazy, and I lived through those, the next five are going to be even crazier. I spent my last two years talking with companies that are building incredible technology right now, focused on machine learning, AI, blockchain, all of these things. What's coming down the pipe that you're going to be seeing literally in, within the next year in the next five years is going to blow your socks off. The old order in the 1980s, it was high prices and a very limited number of choices. 
really the brand dominate. The brand was able to dominate. They were able to control the media. They were able to control the retail shelf. They were able to control the customer experience. 1990 to 2010, huge transformation. You had not only the internet coming in, but you had the Walmart effect. This is, you know, remember Walmart? They were the big guys before Amazon. So they come in and you've got all of the money is now leaving all the local markets. You have the decimation of the downtown core and everybody thinks, oh, that's it. Then all of a sudden you hit stagnation, 2010 to 2015. Big businesses are cutting costs. Local businesses are trying to figure out what they're going to do. Everybody's trying to figure out online. Then it started to come together. Since 2015, like think about how you now order. You have condos right now that they've got refrigerators in their front area because you have millennials who order the food online. It gets delivered to their condo. They Uber back and forth to work. They've figured out Amazon. They need to replace the light bulb. It's done. They get it delivered that day or the next day. A complete transformation. Everything just started to come together. And all of a sudden, there's all of these, I'm not going to go pay to Gillette. I'm going to get a Harry's subscription. Totally changed. The CPG markets, they're trying to figure it all out right now because people don't want to eat shitty food. They don't want to eat the big brand stuff. They want artisanal, right? Remember when that wasn't a word? Now you've got what's coming up. 2020 and onward. Big businesses can't react fast enough. You've got a situation where you've got more flexibility, market intelligence, a lot of data. You've got customization and technology that's allowing people to understand exactly what it is that they need, how to get it, and you've got an entire system that's set up on personalizing that experience. Now what's coming up? We're going to be seeing tech-savvy small businesses which you're already starting to see. Micro brands that operate as well as what big brands used to do. They can move faster, they can think faster, they have real... I'm going to stand on this side now. <laughs> so you've got small companies that are actually able to create big brands. And that's causing a lot of disruption. It's creating a lot of opportunities because there's a lot of merger, a lot of acquisition, a lot of those things happening. So how do we get prepared for all of the change? So th the first part is there's all sorts of trends and there's a lot of signals of change that you need to start to be aware of. So looking at what's happening in social changes, what's happening in technological, economic, environmental, political, value changes. So my wife is now working at a not-for-profit and, and, and it's so interesting because you think of, of value changes. She was in a presentation, and when she said what, what they went through, I was like, oh, okay, I, I kind of get it. There's a part of me that doesn't get it. There's a part of me that definitely supports it, and there's a part of me that just goes, oh. And when they did the introductions, it was, hi, I'm Jennifer, and I refer to myself by her. It's a value change. It's a significant value change. You're seeing it in advertising. If you take TTC, you're seeing on the ads trans models. You're seeing all sorts of things that are all happening. Significant value changes that you're either with or you're against, and things are really going to impact your business depending on what side you, you fall over in the next 10 years, right? So how do we prepare for all of these changes? So I'm going to start off first and foremost with purpose. You need to, to have an organization transform based on an aligned and a very bold vision, and it needs to have purpose and a strategy attached to it. Why is that? Well, it starts really with the question of why. What is your purpose? Why are you guys doing what you're doing? And look, I've, I've worked with dealers. I've worked with all the departments since 2001. So whatever goes through your head, trust me, I know what's going through your head in terms of, yeah, fuck, really? Come on, that's never going to happen. OK. If you don't have a purpose, or if you don't know what your purpose is, ask your staff. And if it ends up that you're selling cars and ROs, you are so ready for disruption because your product looks the same, your service expectations are relatively the same, you're saying the same things. So customers need to have a reason to believe in you and in going to you. And not just customers, employees. Why do they want to come to you? 
What is motivating them to be able to say, this is a company that I want to work for, this is a company I want to work with? What are your values? And, and, and are they real, are they meaningful for your staff and your customers? Your staff, they're your internal customer. So do they resonate with anything? Do they mean anything? Saying that you're honest or you're this or that, how are you living those values? How are you living those principles? And how you're going to know if you have them or what they are, ask your staff and ask your customers. Because going back to that whole notion of 81% of executives feel like they really have created a collaborative environment, 41% of staff said, yeah, no. Or, you know, you've got that, that big gap there. You've got to actually have something that's real and that's meaningful within your organization. What's your culture? Because that's really what's going to afford into it. You're competing against people that have not just ping pong tables, but they're bringing in people that will do back massages. They're bringing in all of these things. And I know you're getting hit with tight profit centers, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter because if you want to start attracting the best people, I'm not saying that you need to bring all of that stuff in. What I am saying is you've got to concentrate on your culture and recognize that if you're trying to bring in the Gen Z, the millennials, or any of the really, really talented people, what's going to really attract them is going to be your culture. It's going to be what it is that you're offering beyond a pay package. If all you're offering is a pay package, you've got mercenaries working for you. So do potential employees see your culture as an, an attractive place to work? Does your team buy in and do they believe that you believe in those, th those values? Th there was a, a, an incredible dealership that they started to switch over and they said, you know what, I'm not going to worry about the bottom line. I'm going to start to concentrate on just giving back to the community, but in a real meaningful way. And he allowed a certain amount of hours every month where all the staff got paid, didn't matter where they volunteered their time, but they had to volunteer their time. That started to create an incredible culture within the dealership. People really like working because they actually believe that the dealer principal believed in community service. All the stories spread within the community in terms of all the activities, and they promoted those activities. And literally, he said to me, the one year that I stopped concentrating on the P&L was the most profitable year we had. That's a purpose. Those are values. That's actually living something that, that the employees can, can live to. And that is a real dealer example. That happened. And it really worked for him because he really believed in what he was trying to do. So in going through all of that, you then need to sit down and repeat and make sure it's consistent. It needs to become part. So what I'm talking about is not going to be a quick bullet solution. This is something that's going to happen over years. I've had to change my career countless times from starting out and just doing traditional advertising to what I do today. It's been a complete evolution. So what you need to focus on is strategic alignment, transformation, understanding, training, and commitment. So I'm going to go through all of these. So taking a look at strategic alignment starts with your recruitment and your selection. So there's a whole interview process. So design and interview your questions and assessments to really understand if the candidates are aligned with your roles, especially given the fact that those core values and bringing those people on, the types of questions you ask are going to be reaffirming for them that, OK, this is a company that I can kind of work with. If I go back to that one individual, and he was asking, what do you do currently in the community? What are your volunteer efforts? Here's what we do here. Here's how we use our time. It's not just an interview. It's actually much more of a conversation that's establishing and, and making sure that, that there is an extension of those values that is starting from day one. And rate the person in terms of their perceived alignment with each core value. And then if they fit in, then now you've got something that you can start to build with. Hiring them, though, is just the first step. How many of you actually have an orientation package? OK, some. So when some people come in, there's a real orientation. It feels real. You're, 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 welping, you're welcoming them into your team. You're allowing them to be able to, to step in from the first day with the feeling of, of this is the right decision that I made. Because the first day is nervousness, but it's also that day where you go, Shit, should I have said yes? Is this the right company? You're, you're really affirming they made the right choice. And that's establishing that you really do live by those values. 
So being able to start to go through that, that's pretty, pretty key. Then going through that is that notion of storytelling. So there's lots of stories here where, and I'll give an example of, of the legendary story that this dealership used. There was a, a couple that bought a minivan. And the, I can't remember if it's the mother or the father, uh, who had, had gone into hospital down in Florida. So they flew down there. So let's take possession of the vehicle. They were like, you know what? They're going through a really hard time. They just bought this minivan. One of the staff got in the minivan and actually drove it down to Florida for them. That became a legendary story that they retell. Because that's now saying, this is how far we'll go. We had empathy in terms of what was happening in, in that customer's lives. And we want to make a difference. We want to say, you're part of our family. You're going through a hard time. So that's what they did. So mixing the legendary stories that really help show the values and the philosophy and then cultivating that further in day-to-day -day stories that are reaffirming what it is that, 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 that you stand for. Being able to also take a look at performance appraisals and handbooks. So sitting down and, and having a system that's actually written down and it's organized, connected to what it is that you're doing that everybody has access to. And what you can do is you can actually organize it not in a traditional HR manual, not here's how many days off you have, here's what we stand for and here's examples. Here is part of your time off is you get X amount of hours because we believe in community commitment. So those are the sorts of things that you can start to set up in a creative way. Don't do the necessarily structured, traditional way of taking a look at things. Recognition and reward. Organize and reward all around all of these. One of the things that I've seen happen in a lot of dealerships, I think you'll all be able to react to this. When things go bad, it's somebody's fault and we're gonna make sure that they know it and we're gonna make sure that the team knows it. That doesn't happen when somebody does something well or it's not celebrated enough. Spending more time focused on pushing the organization where you want it to go versus punishing the organization from where it was is gonna be really, really critical. And don't be afraid to fire. I think one of the biggest issues that I've seen in almost every organization, so this isn't just automotive, so-and-so is a really good performer, so-and-so is a really good seller, yeah, you know what, they're also assholes. And they're damaging your culture, they're damaging your business, they're making people that are really good people quit, and they're throwing the whole organization off. Try to train, try to reward, but don't be afraid to fire and let go. Because you're trying to future-proof for the future. And at the end of the day, when those things start hitting you out of the, 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 the left and the right and from behind you, the individuals that tend to be the people that you should have fired a couple of years ago are the people that are going to sink you as soon as things go really, really badly. So how can you figure out who they are? Are they problem solvers or are they problem finders? It's really easy. Okay. Do they like to be the devil's advocate or can their minds be changed? One of the questions that, that, that I ask a lot when I'm meeting somebody, tell me the last time you changed your mind. Because people that don't have a time where they've actually changed their mind, it's starting to demonstrate that that's going to be a bit of an issue or they need to learn how to change their mind. Because if you aren't able to change your mind, you just keep doing the same things the same way and that's not a good place to be. Do they have their way of doing things or can they adapt to a team approach? Do they have all the information to go through or do they let other people assume authority? In other words, are they the gatekeepers who, who are, are stifling or are they willing to actually let the team succeed? Are they a dictator or are they a mentor? I'm gonna go through some of these pretty quickly here. So having a well-defined transformation and innovation strategy, I think starts with an innovation team. Who in your organization has the time and the responsibility to take a look at the trends and the new technologies that are coming in to actually assess it? I know you're going to say that we don't have time. Make time, because those things, they're going to hit you. If you don't know what's coming up with AI, with chatbots, with all of these things, blockchain, you're going to be finding out. So at least be informed about what's happening. Sit down and investigate outside of the industry, not just the same car and auto events. 
if I've got a condensed period of time so I can go through these quickly. Make sure that that team's sharing it with your management. That's really important. Assess that quarterly and then present to the entire audience, like your entire team, the entire dealership, maybe twice a year so that they're also starting to come in. We used to do at my old agency, we had shit I found Thursdays. We'd bring in pizza and everybody would go and they'd say, what's really cool stuff that's out there? And they'd present it to the entire group. So everybody in the agency had to do that once. So basically by the time that we went through the whole year, everybody had presented to the whole group. But it was a nice way to bring that, that new innovation and what was happening out there. Shit I found Thursdays. The, yeah, with pizza and beer. Uh, review it. Look at the weak links in the team, the structure and the process likely to be disrupted. So assess everything. Is it helping or is it hurting? And is it taking you in the direction to future-proof your business or will it take you into a place where it could be the demise of your business? And then make, make some hard calls. Start the plan. Incorporate technologies and new processes and new people into it. Everything isn't about a new technology, but being able to incorporate the right people with the right training and the right technologies is going to be key. And then test. Everything should be based on KPIs. What's the impact, the challenges, and barriers? What's the expectations versus the implementation and the results? Did the technology improve things or not? And then understand what was happening. So in the technology, one of the things uh, is I like I like people to look at technology as they would their staff. Actually do a review. What, what's the performance report? What's the role? How are they doing? Are they failing, meeting, or exceeding expectations? Are they supported properly? Is training required? Have they been onboarded? And have they kept up with changes that, that are affecting the ecosystem? So review each of your technology exactly the same way as though you were doing a staff review. KPIs. Numbers don't lie. And what you believe is happening is usually wrong, including like, I can't tell you half the times I was wrong. What are the key performance indicators for the technology, people, and innovations? And based on that, keep monitoring them. See where people are slipping, where are people growing. Agree to what they are and maintain them. Because numbers make sure that you've got an even platform that removes emotion. And from a team, does the ownership support transformation and innovation? Because root rot begins at the top. If they don't buy into it, it doesn't matter. Your employees are going to quit. I'm not going to tell you otherwise. They're going to keep doing what they're doing till it implodes, till they sell it, become the real estate play, or they just turn into a shitty thing and they're just going to ride it out. But the good people are not going to stay. Do the departments support transformation and innovation? Or are they siloed? And does the overall infrastructure allow for these things to happen? You've got to just assess it, take a look at it, and look at it realistically about how can you change that. And a lot of that is all going to be based on how do you improve the experiences for your staff and for your customer. Sitting down on training, I'll go through real fast here. Look outside the industry. Integrate creativity and innovation to the everyday work. That's going to be really important. So if you thought that your team can't respond to this, you're part of the problem. If you don't think that you can integrate new creative ways and innovative ways of looking at your business, you got to think again, because inherently we're all creative individuals. We really are. So that can change. So look for a mentor or a coach. If you don't know how to do it, Go out there and find people. There's tons of meetup groups. There's tons of things that are happening, especially in Toronto Waterloo, that you can actually really get a sense of how much is happening technologically and from an innovation standpoint in this region. Develop a very accommodating leadership style. In other words, listen to all of your people. Don't look down on the subordinates because, again, 51% of people are, le are looking for a job. The last thing that they're going to look for is to take shit day in and day out. So I'm going to jump through a few more of these. Give your workers a real sense of freedom. Invest in the culture. Provide the team and yourself with the resources that you need. Allow employees to fail. And I know it's a tough one, but learn from it collectively together. Acknowledge the contributions when they make them. 
understand how to assess risk, and how to develop innovative ideas. So there's gonna be a lot of stuff there. Happy to, to talk with some people on how to go about doing some of these. And remove the barriers to co cooperation within your teams. That's one of the key, key points. The starting point is the, the owners and managers don't believe in it, and then you've got the departments that aren't willing to do it. Those are two of the key barriers that, that, that are really causing a lot of issues. Remove those and you'd be in a much better spot. I do have some more stuff, but out of time, I believe. So, uh, Try to take a couple more minutes. Couple more minutes. So, hold on. You're worth it. All right, thank you. Uh, so commit, so this is actually the last, so, so we're good. So being able if to, you're gonna master it, what? have a commitment to change and make a real commitment to it. Uh, and it's gonna be important because if you're not committed to it and this is a one-off, it, it, it's just it's not gonna work for you. So status quo won't do. And you gotta look, if you've been doing things the same way for the last 10 years, that's your starting point. Sometimes you're doing it for the past 10 years because it really works. Your customers like it and your employees like it. Keep doing that. A lot of instances, one or both of those, it's not really working in your favor. So those are gonna be the first places that you wanna take a look at and start to change those processes. So the whole notion of the F&I office, and I'm not gonna go into it because it's a minefield, but there's one of your starting points because show me a, cu a customer that appreciates that. Recognize that you got the power to change proactively or reactively, but it's coming. And, and trust me, it's coming. Cu uh, I couldn't stress, go to Collision this upcoming week. It's the largest technology conference in the world, and it's gonna be in Toronto, May 20th. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon, so commit to the long term and ongoing change. Reevaluate people, systems, processes, and technologies on an ongoing basis. Because some are gonna work really well until they stop working really well. And that's when you gotta just assess how to, how to get that change there. Change people, systems, and processes when you need them and as often as you need to. Establish measurements for your customers and your staff so that they can review what you're doing, you can see improvement. So basic surveys, there's tons of things that you can do and lots of really easy technologies out there that are free that you can start to set that all up. And then be okay if you relapse because this is, this is hard but failing is part of what makes this whole innovation process happen. So if things don't work out, just don't give up. Just, just try again. So that's it. That, that's a lot of information. I'll, 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 I'll put, uh, put you on the hook. Are you going to be able to mail this out to everybody? Yeah, anybody can have this. I, I put this together just for you guys. And so feel free to, to have it. And if you got any questions, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to do this. Uh, I don't know if it did what I was hoping it would do. But the intent was to just try to provide some working uh, um, tactics and approaches to be able to, to actually implement something. Um, it's, it's exciting or it's terrifying, depending on how you want to address this and look at it. But, but just look back on how much has changed in the last 20 years. And it's incredible, and you just see the speed of what's coming down here. You really need to get 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 in front of this. And I've got some very, very, very dear friends that are dealer principals, and I've actually sat down and we've gone out for dinner. And I said, start figuring out your exit plan because you will not be around in ten years. So unless this is a real estate play, figure out what you're going to be doing. Mainly single dealerships, but it's that's how strongly I believe that it's going to get. Disruptive. It gave me the feels. I don't know. Everybody? I don't know. <laughs> um, so you connected through uh, to Barry on LinkedIn. Just ask him. He'll send you a deck. We've talked about it beforehand. Uh, we're going to uh, I'll send it to Jason too, and then Jason yep. can also. So we've got a few minutes break. We're gonna, that was our warm up. Uh, first of all, let's give a big hand again for Barry. Uh, we're, we're lucky enough to have that wealth of knowledge. It was a lot of download. That's why he's made the deck available. So thank you very much. Um, we're going to take a few minutes, get drinks, get a snack. We'll set, come back and uh, Mr. Sean Kelly will be up. Um, a couple things to take away that, that Barry took, talked about was, 
you know, the commitment to yourself. How many in the room are salespeople or are dealer staff, not management? That's good, a good number. That's actually a really good turnout. So let me ask the people in the room, what did you take away from this? Exactly, because if I don't like you, I'm not buying from you. Exactly. Who else? Anyone else? The innovation team, I really like those. Yeah, yeah, you know what? You've got a voice. Share it with your dealership. And if they don't want to listen, I'm hiring. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, have a few minutes. Get a drink. Please, you have drink tickets. Go help yourself, and we we'll, can reconvene in just a few minutes.
pocket? It should probably go somewhere where I don't swing my arms around. In your pocket, underneath your jacket? Got it. Thanks, buddy. Have a seat and I'll call you. So, um, first of all, congratulations to you all for being here. It means you want to take a step closer in improving yourself for your career. So for you guys, <laughs> the, the best part of these events is, um, besides listening to me, because I'm, the, I was talking to the other day and someone was like, that voice sounds familiar. I'm like, oh, strip club. It's okay. It's a, um, he's like, I like that voice. I'm like, I know. So. The biggest part about these events is to help you improve at all levels, from the dealer principal down to the lowly salesperson, right? And the biggest thing is understand that if we get better, we can help our customers better, we all benefit, right? So, um, so Sean is, I'm, I'm, I'm awestruck a little bit uh, about Sean. He has- Man crush. Man crush. <laughs> Romance. Romance. Go farther. <laughs> <laughs> Don't talk about the strip club stories. No. Wait, wait, I, I want the crying game. No, it's uh, <laughs> so a little bit uh, about Sean. He has a lot of dealership experience. A lot of vendors uh, in the training side are trainers and not haven't unless they lived or been around the dealership. Uh, I've known a lot of trainers who are tra amazing trainers, but they can't relate to us as humans, as people in the car business. Uh, Rob's shaking his head. He's like, fuck yeah. Um, so the, the, the biggest thing to understand with, with all of it is we're going to learn. Sean's a great speaker. Not only is he really tall, uh, he also is a war vet. So thank you uh, for your services. Uh, he has a lot of life experiences. He actually worked as a, in a dealer in Hyundai. He was the number one Hyundai dealership in St. Louis, the number one in the region as a GSM, and has grown from there. He spent years working with a coaching um, uh, CRM, helping develop it, helping teach it, helping making sure dealers work on it. And, and he wanted something better. So he decided to break out in his own and have the, being the, called the car biz coach. And if you've looked him on LinkedIn, if you haven't followed him on LinkedIn yet, you've got to do it. His content is amazing. Uh, he gives a lot of props to a lot of people, so it'll help promote you. And it's all relevant. And, and a lot of people on, online now aren't relevant. They talk about narcissistic ways and how they've won the battle. And Sean's not like that. He says a lot of how you get better. And I think, he, I think honestly, yeah, I think you really care how people improve. So without me talking anymore, uh, I, I'm going to turn it over because uh, I, I just want to listen to him. Thank you. Thanks, JP. <laughs> you've, you've set the bar pretty high, my friend. Thank you for that. No, I appreciate it, guys. You guys, first off, um, I've never been to Canada before. So I want to tell you, Toronto's, so far what I've seen, the Loose Moose, uh, my Airbnb, and then this place, which so far is awesome. I feel right at home. I was telling Jeremy, I was like, man, I feel like I'm in the old school Bush Stadium back in the day in St. Louis. So I didn't know you guys had baseball up here. I'm totally joking. <laughs> <laughs> totally joking. No, it's a real honor. <laughs> <laughs> honor to be here. I'm already, sorry, Jason, I gotta go. <laughs> All right. So today, what I'm going to be talking about with you guys is training versus coaching. Do we really understand the difference? And now that JP's told you all the awesome things I've done, I'm going to tell you how screwed up I, I am. So. <laughs> That way you can understand the journey and, and why we are all in this room together and I, I happen to be here with you. So um, I, was a, I was in the Army, I was a Special Operations Sergeant and I spent over two years in combat zones. My biggest fear was losing someone on my team and as such I studied leadership like it was the most important thing to master. I read books on it um, and luckily, I was, and thank the Lord, I was able to bring everyone home in one piece uh, after uh, Iraq. I actually was over across in, in that country prior to the war even kicking off. Um, but I got out of the army and I, I did a, a great job turning into a civilian when I bought a house I couldn't afford just before the subprime mortgage crisis um, on one of those, uh, you know, arm loans. And then I, I knocked up my fiance and then I wrecked my car on the way to work. I was doing awesome as a civilian. I was this close to going back in the army. I mean, I was stressed out, man. I couldn't, uh, literally, I was behind 
on my wife's engagement ring payment. I was freaked out, but luckily I had wrecked my car because when I was sitting in the finance office, the man named Jeff Cash, ironically enough, says, hey, um, would you consider selling cars? At the time I was um, working my way through college and applying for jobs at Enterprise. I just applied for a job at Enterprise Rent-A-Car where I was gonna make a $28,000 a year salary. I was really excited about that opportunity, which I didn't get because as I was walking in from the interview, my wife called me, honey, what are we gonna do? I'm pregnant, oh my God. So needless to say, I had a hard time interviewing. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'm sitting in the finance office and the finance manager is like, yeah, you wanna sell cars? I say, how much do you make? And he's like, oh, in a bad month, you can make $3,000. I'm like, I'm in, that's more than I made when I was in combat, are you kidding me? So I, st <laughs> so I started selling cars and I fell in love with the showroom floor, the people, the, the energy, it was like all the awesome things about the military and con you know, but without being shot at, you know, the fast paced business, the, the adrenaline of closing a deal, man, it's a lot like combat. So I, I loved it, um, had a great manager that taught me the right way to do business and ultimately um, I just fell in love with the showroom floor. But my leadership background allowed me to move up pretty quickly and I ended up becoming um, the internet sales manager. I was the first auto trader sales.com salesperson. I was talking to Kyler or to Kyle or Tyler? Kyle. I was talking to Kyle. The, I was the first auto trader.com salesperson in St. Louis and uh, really took to the, had my Joe Verde scripts, man. I was ready to rock. Hey, you guys remember the Joe Verde scripts, man? Gosh, who's the lucky one getting the car? You're someone you know. Got it down. So anyway, um, I then became a finance manager, became a used car manager, and then ultimately became a GSM. And as a GSM, I failed miserably. And what I mean by that is I failed because I had the industry average over the industry average turnover in, in, U, in the USA down there, South America, we'll call it that for now. <laughs> um, we had 90% turnover at my dealership and the average is about 70%. Every time I lost a salesperson and I, I loved my salespeople, I would do anything to try to help them. I would train them, I would, I would try to motivate them, but I still had over the industry average turnover, 90%. And I thought to myself, man, every time I lose a salesman, I feel like I'm losing a soldier in combat. There's gotta be a way to stop it. And I knew we were always number one in St. Louis, but we were spending absorbent amounts of money to be number one in St. Louis. Just crazy marketing money and, and all that. And, and I was like, what, there's gotta be a better way. And, and I knew, I, just like you know, Barry was talking about disruption. I was like, there's gotta be a way to disrupt my business to do a better job. And one day I'm sitting in there and uh, literally, I'm sitting in, the, in a sales, I just gave a sales meeting and I'm sitting next to the owner of my company who sat in and he goes, Sean, you should learn about coaching. And I was like, what's that? Is that when you like yell at one person instead of everyone? <laughs> <laughs> I was in the army. I mean, come on, you, we yell, tell, and then in the car business, we, what do we do? We sell, right? So as a, a leader, most leaders in the auto industry, we're always yelling, telling, and selling, trying to get our point across. And it's freaking exhausting, right? We, we tell people what to do, they don't do it. We ask them to do it nicely, they don't do it. We yell at them, they still don't do it, right? And then we keep them, why? Because it's hard to find good people. Hard to find good people, right? So to Barry's point, to talk about change, okay? I do want to tell you guys that I completely agree with everything he said, and this is about change here. So the change I made was when the owner said, you should learn about coaching, and I said, you know what, I'm gonna learn about coaching and see what that's all about. So I started studying coaching, Within three months of failing as a coach, literally three months of me trying to coach my people, my salesman was like, Sean, what are we doing? Do we really have to do this? And I'm like, there's something here. I just don't get it. But I was like, you know what? I'm, I'm just not good enough yet. So I hired myself a coach. Um, I hired a guy named Keith Rosen. He's one of the top coaches in the world. Um, and basically Keith had trained me how to coach. I started then coaching my team once I had a process for it. And as a result, we, went, we, we set amazing records. We were able to cut our advertising in half. We're the only Hyundai store up in a down market two consecutive years. My turnover went to about 20% from 90%. And ultimately um, I said, this is what I love doing. I've got to do this for a living. So I started on my Tuesday off, I started coaching technology companies. So my first client was Drive Centric CRM. iRecon Cars was another one. I started landing these tech companies and coaching them. I told the owners, I'm, I'm quitting in one year. I'm going to replace my income as GSM as a coach. And, and basically it took me about eight months, but I was able to do just that. I left the showroom floor, promoted seven people under me. They didn't have to hire anyone from outside. Um, and that, my friends, was for me, my, one of my greatest accomplishments ever was to know that the people under me were better off and could replace me just like that. And that's also what I believe led us to create amazing results. The sigmoid curve here, and that's enough about my story, but I want you to understand, guys, I am now, I wanna help you guys avoid the, the negative changes and disruption that Barry was talking about. and. I'm on a mission to bring coaching to the car business because I want you to experience the same results that I've had. I want your salespeople to say, 
hey, you know what? Will you marry me and my fiance on the showroom floor? That is another one of my biggest accomplishments as a manager, as a coach. Um, what, I, want to, I want your employees, I want you to be able to go to your manager who's coaching you and for you to want to make your kid uh, or your boss the godfather of your kid. That's the type of relationship you can have with your manager when we coach our employees. So the sigmoid curve, and I didn't invent it, Ms. some guy named Mr. Sigmoid must have, but bottom line is this, guys, as, as we start doing something new, um, we are not very good at it. Just like when I first started coaching, just like when you first start tying your shoe. You just, you just, you're not very good at it, but you practice over time and you get better. And then we've all heard the saying, if you do what you've always done, you get what you've always gotten. Is that true? Absolutely. What about when you look at this? So check this out. The housing market, it did what it was always doing, right? Did they get what they've always gotten? Toys R Us? We're talking about disruption here. Guys, if you do what you've always done, you get, you get less than you've always gotten. What if Black Book, now this, is, this book has sentimental value. Do you got any, any sales managers in here? <laughs> any car buyers? Okay. Do you guys remember these things? Now, what if Black Book said, you know what, we're not, doing, we're not changing. We're not doing that technology stuff. We're not going to have online Black Books. That's crazy. And they just kept doing this. Would they still be in business, right? So if you do what you've always done, you get less than you've always gotten. At some point, you reach a plateau. How many of you guys are, so we had a fair amount of car salespeople in here. How many of you guys have been selling roughly the same amount of cars today as you were a year ago? Anyone in here? It's okay, don't be ashamed. Most people plateau at a certain area, okay? If, you've, if you're roughly selling the same amount of cars today than you were six months or a year ago, you've reached a plateau. And at some point, if you keep doing what you've always done, you will start going backwards because of the sigmoid curve, because the rest of the world is gonna change around you. So everyone else is advancing. People are changing the way they buy cars. Guys, the, several of the tech companies I consult and coach for, they have artificial intelligence. Man, that sucker's setting appointments for people, right? So we have got to be better as salespeople, as managers. We've got to change the way we lead our people. We've got to change the way we bring people into the car business. We've got to change the way we develop them and keep them in. And we've got to change the way we let them out of the business. So that's what this is about. So, we are going to discuss, I want you guys to, the, your takeaways should be understanding the true difference between training and coaching, how to learn internal training best practices, and also learn how and when you should coach versus train, all right? So first, I will share a stat with you. I have hard data that measures uh, what I call new hire profit loss. So after working with a CRM company um, and seeing all, you know, when, they, when someone leaves a dealership, they remove you from the CRM, hypothetically. Uh, when you come into the dealership, they enter you in. So, if you look at these metrics here, you can see how many uh, ups, and this is, I literally just pulled this like two weeks ago and, and pulled this report out of some ra random dealership I just started coaching. And so this is how many ups they take. And then this is the, and this is walk-in traffic for the record, when I say ups in case it's a different terminology. This is the closing percentage, okay, of that salesperson for those. This is just like two weeks of data, okay? But the reason that I show you this is because three of these people are new hires. Okay, look at the volume of opportunity and the closing percentage. Which three, if you had to guess, which three are new hires? Go ahead and say new hire or not. 32 opportunities compared to the next, uh, you know, 9% uh, closing. New hire or veteran? What do you think? New hire probably? Okay, 24 ups and 25% closing. New hire or not? No, that one's not. This one, don't worry about that. That's someone that just started, literally just started. Um, 18 and 27%. Veteran, that's a new hire, 51 and 16%, 30%, 17. What you're noticing, the trend you're looking at, and this, this goes for almost every dealership I coach, new hires generally take about 40% more opportunities and they close at almost 40% less. And I'm not saying we shouldn't hire people, I'm not saying that, but my point is, is that turnover costs us a ton of money. In, in fact, in this case, the three new hires have waited on 99 walk-ins and the five veteran salespeople have only taken 98, right? And their closing is less. So just taking this store's data, um, just plugging this in here, basically if they had all veterans, they would have sold 81 cars, okay? But because of the situation they're in, they 55 cars. And that is 26 lost sales as a result of turnover or putting new people on the team. And that doesn't matter if they're a green pea or brand new sales, new to the car business, or they came from another dealership. I found that there's very little difference there. And that's because of the cultural differences. So they're also intangible profit loss, all right? How many, oh my gosh. For managers, it's so frustrating when our salespeople say things like, oh, the new, more new hires are flooding the floor. A anyone heard the, whole, the saying, they'll hire anyone with a pulse? Anyone said or, or heard that or said it? 
Guys, that creates stress whenever we hire people. So intangible profit loss. In addition to the lost sales, we have customer retention, uh, lower customer retention. Managers spend a lot of time onboarding office staff. Those poor office people have to do all the paperwork to get to stock in a, uh, in a salesperson. Damage external brand. When someone quits, like Barry was talking about earlier, when someone leaves your dealership, they're not gonna be talking good about your dealership if they leave on negative terms, right? Community reputation. Stressful for all employees, potential legal complaints, lower survey scores, damaged internal brand. Guys, we all know that a new salesperson can't provide the, they don't have the level of product knowledge and can't provide the level of support necessary. So understanding that turnover was one of my biggest challenges that I wanted to tackle and in doing so with coaching, um, I was able to lower that. So I'm gonna share with you guys how to do it. And I also want you to understand how coaching affects performance. And guys, if you're a salesperson and you're not receiving coaching, that you got invest in yourself. I don't care if it's with me, just hire, I, I just hired my second coach and I didn't fire my first one. I just hired my second coach two days ago because I want to invest more in myself. But an employee motivated, this is, there are 10 things that motivate employees. Number one, am I valued? Does my manager care about me? Number two, am I appreciated? You know, am I recognized, like literally, do, do I get recognized for doing a good job? Um, do I have a purpose? Is what I'm doing actually fulfilling for me? Do I feel good about what I do? I'll never forget as a manager when I, my purpose was about the money. For so long as a salesman, I was like, I gotta become a manager, that was my purpose. Then I became the manager and, I, and I was, my purpose was money related and it was just kinda, I was going through the motions every day. Then I was like, you know what? I promoted someone and it felt so good. I was like, that's my new mission. That's my new purpose is to promote people, move people up. All of a sudden my drive went through the roof. I was coaching a salesperson uh, in Kentucky a few weeks ago and he, literally his boss like please get him to be motivated Sean I'm like okay I'll try my best you know um, so I sat down with this fellow really nice guy and he had a convert basically I was like what motivates you he's like well you know when I go outside and it's rainy or it's cold and then I just want to go inside and sit down he sells 10 cars a month I'm like so is it the money that motivates you? he's like nah I live with my dad I'm like well what what drives you what are you passionate about And he's like cancer I was like tell me more about that and then he tells me that he lost, he had lost his, uh, one of his parents, his mom to cancer, his grandparents to cancer, and one of his siblings. So for him, that's a big deal. I said, well, what do you do for cancer research? And he's like, well, I, um, he's like, I, I do a lot of charity bike ride event and things like that. And ultimately, I said, well, what if you sold cars for cancer? And he's like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, you only need to make 3,000. So what if every dollar you made over 3,000, you gave half of it to cancer research? And he started doing that. So instantly, the next month, he doubled his sales never went backwards. Um, started making social media posts, so purpose is something that motivates people. Um, fulfillment, uh, are we skilling up? Are we mastering new skills? Are we independent? Do we, can we make our own choices or do we feel like we're micromanaged by our managers? Um, are we developing in our career? Can we move onward and upward in our career at the pace we wanna move? Team cohesion, are we part of a team that's all working together to accomplish a common objective? Is work fun? Uh, man, if, if you don't make fun, work at the dealership fun, there, people are going to find a way to make it fun. There was a, I, had a, I had a dealer principal I was coaching, and he, he, he came to me so mad. He's like, Sean, I was just down there, and I saw those guys playing Jenga. You guys have Jenga up here, the little blocks of wood? Okay. He's like, I saw the salespeople in one of the parts offices playing Jenga. I mean, during the work day, what the heck? I go, well, how, long, how, how many hours a day do they work? He's like, you know, 12. I'm like, okay, so they should not have fun for 12 hours? I'm like, that's really nice of you. He's like, good point. But I, I was like, well, what if you make work intentionally fun? You know, like go down there and have Jenga time. You know, like you schedule, like, just go down. So he ended up getting the, he's like, that's a good idea. So he got those little two by, the bigger version of it with the two by fours. So now he goes through his dealership. He plays a little Jenga game with his team intentionally. And then he, afterwards, it's 20, 30 minutes of fun. And he's like, get back to work. Though I'm telling you, they run to the phones. They, they do two, two to three times the calls that day because they, you gotta make work fun. Um, leader, do I have a leader to model after? The three C's of leadership, someone who is character, competence, and cares about me. And then finally, competition. Is there healthy competition? So that's an actual picture. I don't look like that anymore. I wish I did, it was pretty awesome. But bottom line, I show you this picture <laughs> because in the army, we had that, was, which one's me? That right there. <laughs> <I'm just kidding. laughs> Him right there. So, when I was in the Army, we had objectives, we had missions. I think in the car business, we just kind of go about it. Our only objective at any given time is to do what? Sell a car, right? Sell a car. I think we need objectives, focused intent in anything we do. So when you hire someone, what are your objectives? Managers, when I ask them that, I hear the same thing. Throw, them against, throw it against the wall and see if they stick, right? 
let's, let's throw them against the wall, see if they stick. Well, I wanna share three better hiring objectives with you. What if objective number one was to ensure every new employee or new to role employees have a solid foundation for success? Objective number two, ensure your employees or new to role employees are aligned to a mutually agreed upon ramp up time. Okay, meaning competency and they know where they need to be and by when they need to be there. And thirdly, all employees receive ongoing development so they continue to grow forever. I know that sounds crazy. We start selling enough cars and right, right, we're good enough. Leave that guy alone, they sell enough cars. We always leave them alone, so that's something. So what if those were the three objectives anytime you bring someone into your company? What new possibilities would you create? So I'm gonna talk about onboarding very briefly. Onboarding is like the foundation of a house. All right, you saw the slide. The, the onboarding is, um, you can't, bottom line is this, a house built on a foundation of sand will not stand. Safe to say? Onboarding is like a foundation for the employee. So what can we do for onboarding? Guys, you just met me. Um, I don't know you, right, correct? I don't know either of you guys. I have a van outside, get in it, we're going somewhere. Are you in? Yep. Sure. Oh, we got some part, this, uh, you're Jason's friends, I should have known. <laughs> The bottom line is this, guys, we, we need to build trust with our, <laughs> it's my favorite slide. I use it like half my slideshows, even if it doesn't fit in. I'm like, by the way, there's this slide. But guys, what builds trust? We need our employees to trust us. So one of the best ways we can do it is tell them where the van's going and why it's going there, right? That way, just like Barry was talking about, are we aligned to the direction of the company? Have the cultural vision. This is an actual cultural vision. We, one of the things that my company does is, bottom line is this, how do we get to, you to a destination if you don't know where you want to go? So the cultural vision or the company vision is like your vision for success. This is where we're trying to go. Because ultimately, if we start with the end in mind, we know the destination, now we know who we need to surround ourselves with. And who should we? The people that want to go to the same place we're going. So that's critical to building, your, to onboarding, is sharing that vision with the people you're hiring before you hire them. And then also is having clear expectations. Are your expectations written down? And are they clear and concise? This is a used car manager expectation sheet. It's six pages long, and every single one of them needs to be initialed off, signed off on, and, and trained on before they promote someone in that role. Also, make sure they fit into the culture of the dealership. You know, if it's fun, I had a, well, he was a middle finger, Zach there was middle fingering me. That was back as a GSM. But we just, just had one of our record months there, it was awesome. Also, helping them understand the lay of the land at your dealership. When someone comes into your store, guys, you know, little, it's the little things that add up. There's a saying, as it starts is as it goes. So what if you brought someone in the company and showed them where the copy paper was? Like, what if that was part of the process, right? What if they had to do a scavenger hunt to find all the little things that they're gonna come up to the manager and ask directions for? You know, give, so an onboarding process that lasts 30 to 90 days, um, that covers all the little nuances. That way, at the end of that time, right, they're, they're ready to rock, okay? Now, onboarding is the foundation and then once you've got that foundation you get a nice house then you get this shiny car shiny cars look great training is critical and I, I part of what we do we do a lot of training but I think training in the auto industry is challenged and I'll tell you why because number one their managers aren't trained on how to train people and is it, there's a skill set required for that and number two uh, you got a lot of outside trainers right and they say hey here's my software platform buy this and you can take the training but it's not real necessarily real and relevant to your dealership and the managers don't take it and as a result, it never becomes indoctrinated into the DNA of your store. So one of the things, you, internal training best practices, what I'm gonna share with you guys today. Who should I be training? Who should we train? So obviously, new hires that finish onboarding. Train, train salespeople out of sell cars. Number two, anyone you're grooming for a promotion. Is that, did anyone receive training before they were promoted for the job they're gonna be in here? Very important, man. That way, when you hit the ground in that role, you hit the ground running. Um, it sets you up for success. One, any, anytime you have one person deep in a critical role, I, I deal with dealers, I hear this at dealers all the time when we do our cultural assessments. Um, hey, we, have, we only have one dealer trade person. We only have one car appraiser. Train someone else to back them up. Get that person ready for the next role in the organization. Um, anyone new in a role with your store? Also, um, on any and all growth areas. Guys, if you focus on everything, then what's important? What are you focusing on at your dealership? What are you focusing on as a salesperson? For where, where are you growing? What is your focus? You need to pick something and laser focus on it for at least 90 days so the things become habits, okay? And that's where you would conduct your training on that growth area. Like, I'm, I'm working with uh, this Mercedes store on phones, and everything we're doing is about phones. It's phone coaching, it's phone training, it's 
phone mystery shopping, and, and over nine days, they've, they've gone up about 20% on cl phone closing percentage, and, and literally, they're 10% they're ahead of where they were aiming to be by this point. And uh, we're gonna pick a new one at 90 days. So what should I train on? Sales processes and be best practices. How many of you guys get sales training? This is, how you should, this is what you should say. Pretty much everyone gets that, right? So here's some of the things you probably may, may not be getting. Actually, raise your hand if you receive um, that type of, please, everyone raise your hand if you get sales training. Okay, I wanna see, okay. And then, and then what about on software and tools? Raise your hand if you get on the, okay, on your CRM, video stuff, okay. What about how to train and coach? Is anyone getting training on that? Okay, very few, okay, fewer. Uh, leadership development, how to manage and lead a team, okay. A little bit less even. Soft skills, how to communicate effectively, how to have difficult conversations, okay. Awesome, and then also cross-department training. Almost no one does this. Can your parts people come up and sell a car? Can your sales people go back and, and help with write an RO? These are opportunities. So manager's um, skill transfer process. If I threw you in an airplane and said, hey, go fly it, how successful would you be? Not very, right? So how can we make sure that we are setting our people up for success? Managers, if you're receiving training, here's how it needs to happen, salespeople, and managers are giving it. It's just like teaching someone how to drive a stick shift. Um, if you, anyone in here know how to drive a stick shift? Okay, pretty much everyone, okay. So if you were gonna teach me to drive a stick shift, I, I don't know how, what would that look like? What would step one be? Uh, step one would make sure that you're hooking the clutch. Okay. Before you start the car. Okay, so you would have me driving it first? No, that's a good point. Okay. I would show you, would show you how to drive it first. Okay, so you would drive it first. Yeah. And then while you were driving it, what would you do? Okay, so you'd tell me how to drive it. Okay, and then what would be the last step? I uh, would get you in the car and go around the parking lot and slowly, you know, get you into the shift. Awesome. That, it's that simple, guys. The same things that we try to teach, that we need to treat, teach our employees to do and our coworkers to do and even our managers to do are the same. It's just like teaching someone to drive a stick shift. Tell them how to do it, show them how to do it, and then finally watch them doing it and see if they kill it. We can't just tell people how to drive a stick shift and then expect them to go be able to drive a stick shift anymore. And that's one of the, that's a, a simple skill transfer process. And if you do that every single time, I loved what uh, Kyle said earlier. He said, yeah, I, I train them on phone stuff. Then I listen to their call. I listen to their calls. And I'm like, awesome. He's teaching them how to drive a stick shift, right? So that's an easy skill transfer process. But best practices, okay, how should you be training? It should be carved out classroom, classroom setting, skill assessments before, um, shadow team leaders, how many guys have team leaders at your dealership, anyone? Man, it, team leaders, um, having that employee, th that's who you're grooming for the next line of, of leadership. Team leaders can take on this role and they should do it without extra pay because they're learning to lead people, all right? And you're learning to uh, help you know, people get better. You, your success can be judged by how well you groom someone you're, that's shadowing you. Um, Strengths-based training, do an when you're assessing people uh, consistently, you find out who's good and who's challenged in key areas, right? And if I find out that um, you're really good on the internet, then I could say, you know what, would you teach a class on the internet once, once a month for the entire dealership? Ultimately, as a manager, I don't have to do it all if I delegate that out. Um, desired training for current employees. Who wants training? You know, bottom line, if I asked each of you guys, write down one thing, one area where you want training, how many different answers do you think we'd be just in this room here? A lot of different answers. Would you guys agree with that? So, but where do we get our topics for training? Who decides what we're gonna train on? What did you say? Manager. The, yeah, the manager, managers are like, this is where you need training, let's do it. And everyone, uh, you know, and I'm not saying that, like I said, group approach is okay, but ask your people. If, if one third of this classroom says, hey, I want training in how to ask for the sale, or overcoming objections, that would be the class. And what's the level of buy-in for that class if that's where they want the training? Right? If they want it there, they'll, they'll listen to you there. Whereas if I just try to cram it down your throat, you might not like it. Also, um, need training for everyone. Um, managers can also decide, but everyone should go through. You should have a curriculum that everyone should go through. And then ultimately, there should be content, and it shouldn't just be me talking in a classroom. There should be content materials and even job aids or scorecards. Right? So it's not just a real subjective approach. Um, benefits to involving the team. If you involve, like if you Pay, take your team leaders, um, the salespeople that are really good in key areas, your BDC people training on internet stuff, your social media guy training on social media, 
um, it will make that person better because when we train someone on something, we get better, right? Another thing too, it'll bind the team. If I help someone, if I help onboard and train someone as a salesperson, I now have a vested interest in their success, right? And now there's more than one person looking out for that salesperson. Um, help identify and cultivate the next leaders. Employees get multiple perspectives. Man, if as a manager, I can only say how I do it a certain amount of times, right? So salespeople, they, we all get tired of hearing the same thing. So ultimately when someone else, if, if hearing another perspective can go a long way in helping someone learn a new, in a new key area. Another thing too, um, when you train someone, it meets certain employee motivation requirements, right? These here, so they're feeling valued because we're investing in training, whether it's the manager's time or an outside training. Um, does it help them feel appreciated or recognized? Eh. Does it help them find purpose? Not really. Um, does it help them skill up? 100%. Does it make them more uh, autonomous? It can. Um, does it help people develop and move up in their career? Absolutely. Becoming better and more skilled certainly does. Um, does t training help with team cohesion? It can if you do it you know, internally. Um, is it fun? Training should and can be fun. Does it help, the, uh, you know, sh does it show the leader is competent and cares? I would say yes. And then um, does it create healthy competition? Not so much. Why should you test on training? So this is the reason. Can I do it? If we don't test on training, we never find out if they really can do it. And, and if we don't know if someone can do it or not, how will we know? Usually we find out after the results come in. But by the time the results are in, we've already lost the sales, it's too late, right? So test for competency up front. But what training does not accomplish, my friends, is this. Do they want to do it? Do they need to do it? And will they do it? Training only covers that one, whereas coaching gets these, all right? So if training is the shiny car, coaching is the fuel that makes it go. So a 20, I, I really believe this time and time again. A tw if I was a 20 car salesperson and got promoted into management, I cannot train a 30 car salesperson to sell 40 cars a month, but I can coach them there. It's that simple. I can coach them there, and that's the only way to take your middle of the road or average, the, the salespeople that have plateaued, or even your top producers. I don't care if you're a 50 car salesperson, if you only sell 50 cars a month and you've been doing it consistently for six months, you've reached a plateau. You've stopped growing, right? You need to make a change. So coaching, who should I coach? Let me run you through the list. Anyone that's been tested for competency and training, once they have the foundation of training, now we can start coaching them. Uh, middle of the road, top producers, um, anyone wanting a promotion. This is, by the way, so important, guys. This was huge in me growing my dealership sales and results because think about this. Would you rather see a 20% increase from a 10 car salesperson, if you're a leader, right? Or would you rather see a 20% increase of a 20 car salesperson? It's, it's, it's two extra cars, it's twice the cars. So coaching is where you can take these guys and make them better. Whereas when they go to training, what do they always say? Oh, you know, I've, I have one or two takeaways. They always say, I like training. I always take one thing away. After two days, you take one thing away. Are you kidding me? So that's where coaching will really help them. Um, anyone who's going, wanting to move up needs coaching. All right. Bottom performers, coach them up or, ah, I forgot to take that out. I got rid of coach out. I don't believe in that anymore. Okay. So all leadership, all leadership, I'm not kidding. I don't like, because I don't want coaching to get a bad name. And it really, sometimes it does have a bad name because of, Oh, I, I'm coaching you, but really I'm just yelling at you, right? So um, all leadership within the organization, every leader, it's lonely at the top, man. And I don't care if you're a dealer principal or you're a porter, every single person needs coaching because it's hard to read the label when you're inside the bottle and you guys are in the bottle every single day. You're on the field playing to win. You need a third party perspective that's not attached to the outcome to have a, a conversation with you. Every pro athlete has a coach. All right, so here's how you can roll it out, okay? The, this, is what I, this is the car motivators drip method. So first, discover um, what every employee wants most. The best way to motivate someone is by connecting the dots on what they want most and what you need them to do. So for instance, um, you know, my friend Matt, who the cancer research, great opportunity. Um, hey Matt, what if you could donate to cancer and make a difference because you sold a bunch of cars? All of a sudden, the guy who's one of the top closers but doesn't want to get out and wait on anyone because he's unmotivated now has motivation, right? So if you can connect the dots on what someone wants most to what they need to do, um, then you can, and I'll, I'll share another story with that in a minute. So number two, recruit everyone to the cause. You can't win a war with a one-man army, and within 15 seconds of any conversation, someone's gonna decide are they fighting along with you or are they fighting against you? So how do we recruit someone to our conversation where they, there's total buy-in and they're on our side? This is how, it's really, really easy. Number one, know what they want most, 
Uh, what, what do you want most in the next 12 months? What would make your career awesome for you if it happened? A bigger role. Okay, uh, so move up in the company. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna say. If I was going to coach my friend, and what was your name? Warren. Warren, awesome Warren. So if I was gonna coach my friend Warren here, I'd say, Warren, what I want for you is to see you move into a bigger role in your organization. And there's a few ways I think we can help you get there. Is now a good time to have that conversation or when would you want to? He wants to have this conversation. Really, I'm gonna train him on how to handle internet leads. He does, does I'm just joking. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Because does, does helping Warren handle internet leads help him get a bigger role in the company? Absolutely it does. Because if he can handle internet leads, he's gonna be a better, better, I'm not saying you need that, but at the end of the day, recruit them to the cause by telling them what you want for them. Individually set expectations around coaching. Everyone wants to be coached differently. I can't coach Warren the same way I'd coach Kyle, the same way I'd coach Jason. So, or Arthur, where's Arthur? Where's that? Oh, there he is back there. What's up, buddy? I know Arthur. I do have some Canadian friends, for the record. I don't, probably not after this, but <laughs> I'm just joking. All right, so individually set expectations around coaching. How often would you, what if we asked every person, hey, how often would you want to sit down with your manager? How often would you want to have a one-on-one? -on -one? What would you hope to accomplish in our one-on-ones? How can I help your career? What if your manager sat down and, and asked you those questions? How, how many of you guys would enjoy that? Anyone in here would, would enjoy that? I haven't yet met a salesperson that doesn't want that for you managers. Um, Finally, P, persist in making a priority and scheduling it. And this is where that one man deep in critical positions. Of course, there's no time for you to uh, coach people when you're the only person in the role, right? So if we're developing the people under us, if we're training people for the next role, then I can say, you know what, Warren, I'm preparing you for the next role because you're gonna grow within this organization and I wanna make sure we help others do the same. Can you watch the desk for me uh, and go ahead and do that while I go and coach some people? Are you excited to do that? Are you gonna to try to prove yourself and knock it out of the park for me? And, and now I'm making my people better? Did my life just get easier as a manager or what? Right? And by the way, when you go back on the floor, are you running about like running laps around people now? You're like, you think about that. I don't even know what position you are. All right, so three types. He could be like a GSM and he wants to be a GM, I don't know. But anyway, uh, so three types of coaching, all right? There's aspirational coaching. So this is something that I created. Aspirational coaching is, is not your, as, as the coach, it's not ever your agenda, it's always their agenda. So what I mean by that is I would sit down and I'd say, hey, where can I coach you today? How can I help you? All right, there is turnaround coaching where we're gonna coach up underperformers, and then there is objective-based coaching, I call it ABC metric coaching. So this one will help you make smart firing decisions and feel good, that, as a manager, I, I would hold on to people, Barry, you're gonna slap me for this. As, as a young manager before coaching, I would hold on to people, they're gonna turn around any day now. But month after month after month, they were costing us business. They weren't happy. They weren't aligned to the direction of the company. This helps you make smart firing decisions. This creates massive motivation, and this one helps you improve performance in key areas. So to touch on each, each of these, um, discover what people want most. Recruit them to the conversation. Um, remember, this is aspirational coaching. It's the coachee's agenda, not yours, all right? You cannot be attached to the outcome. You need to inquire to inquire. Everyone has, I believe that, Everyone in this room, what, think of your biggest goal, your biggest challenge. You have 97% of the answers to accomplish that goal or overcome that challenge. You have 97% of the answers, but it's the 3% you don't have that are holding you back, right? So when we're doing aspirational coaching, you are gonna ask them at least seven questions and you're gonna aim to find out which three puzzle pieces they're missing. And that's the value you add. That's why coaching, every conversation is a 100% value add because I'm always giving you puzzle pieces that you, didn't, you don't have. But you have to ask the questions to find out what puzzle pieces they do have first. Does that make sense? So it's not coaching unless you ask at least seven questions. Verify the value, what you're gonna educate them with, that they don't have it or know it, that they haven't tried it. And then co-create an action plan. It's all about the collaboration. It's not me telling you what you're gonna do, yelling, telling, and selling anymore. It's me saying, okay, so after this conversation, what are your biggest takeaways? What's changed moving forward? What, what are you gonna do? What's your action plan? When will you start doing that by? When should I check in on you? How can I support you? These are all um, co you know, uh, accountability questions, right? Co-create the action plan, confirm the value of the coaching, care for the plan long-term. Um, with metric coaching, we're gonna assess the data, look for the biggest opportunities, uh, get the buy-in around the conversations with recruitment, and then we're gonna, again, co-create action plans. These are all different processes that need to be part of your management leadership routine. And if they're not, my friends, you're missing, you're missing the boat big time. This is turnaround coaching, all right? So this, this was my process for it. It takes a, it basically the last four weeks. But number one, 
sit down with the person who's underperforming, ask them, hey, are, do you want to work here or not? Because maybe they don't want to work for you. And that's okay, it's not, right. it's not wrong, it's just reality. So if they don't want to be on the team, then let's, let's end it now. But what if they want to be there? Well, I'm attend to keeping you if you're to attend to staying. So I'm going to recruit you to the conversation, all right? I'm going to commit. We're going to sit down once a week for the next month, and we're going to talk about your expectations. We're going to check in. We're going to make sure that you're meeting the expectations and doing what it takes to achieve the results. We're going to sit, and then at the end of the month, at the end of 30 days, we're either going to shake hands and part ways as friends, knowing it's just not a good fit, or we're going to party and celebrate that you're still on the team. I found that you can take 60, uh, it was, last I checked, it was 64%. 64% of underperformers can be turned around in 30 days using this process. And the other 38%, they leave on good terms with documented, tracked opportunities for them to turn around. So it's never a bad break when you do this. So those are the three different types of, of coaching just at a real high level, okay? And we can, my company conducts thousands of those with dealers across uh, South America um, every, single, every single year. And, and tech companies too. And dues, so here are some dues, okay? Ask at least seven questions before adding value. Um, schedule the next coaching conversation right then. Schedule the check-in. Hey, when should I check in on, that pro on, on your progress? There's gotta be follow-up and accountability. There's gotta be a check-in or the, the chance of them doing it is, is unlikely. Clarify accountability measures and rules of engagement. Hey, if you're failing, if you're not following through, how do you want me to approach you in a positive, supportive way rather than negative? What if we ask our employees that? They, they give us permission on how to approach them. Then it's never an awkward, uh, challenging conversation and then track all coaching wins guys that's the best part about the follow-up and the next coaching session because when you sit down for the next coaching session and I'm like Kyle what'd you do and Kyle's like man I sat down with my salespeople and I recruited them to the conversations and I got the buy-in and then they actually followed through I'm gonna be like pow coaching win Kyle got his sales team to use the scripts we that we talked he talked about with them I'm just making up examples here give yourself permission to learn something new you're gonna screw up coaching when you first start it just like when you first hire shoe or try to fly a plane that's okay give yourself permission to fail this is a list of but just a bunch of coaching wins eight this dealership has an 872 dollar per car track your coaching wins measure them that's how you show an ROI on your efforts coaching don'ts do not this is the most important thing do not please guys write this down whatever you do when it comes to coaching do not under any circumstance try to coach your wife it does not work. I just, my wife, she's like, you're doing your coaching crap on me. I'm like, I'm sorry, honey. Um, don't do that. But seriously, don't uh, use coaching to punish people. Don't call it coaching if it's negative because coaching is lifting people up. Coaching is taking the next level. Don't make it your agenda. Make it theirs. All right? Don't skip steps in the coaching process. When someone has a limiting belief that's holding them back, don't try to fight them on it. Right? Internet leads are bad. Oh, man, Jason, like, just, he, just turned, ugh, he just cringed when I said that. But when a salesperson, what's the manager's first inclination when they hear that? They go on the attack. What do you mean internet leads are bad? They're opportunity. You can't convince someone you're fighting against them. You're not going to win them over unless you kill them, right? <laughs> and that's not winning, really. So motivation requirements met by coaching, all of them. If we coach our people, you will meet motivation requirements. And as a result, your turnover will go down to almost zero, and people will run through brick walls to achieve results. All right? So where should I start? Number one, read about coaching. I will be done by on time, I promise. Okay, okay. Number one, read about coaching, guys. Uh, my favorite, my, my coach's book, Coaching Salespeople and the Sales Champions. I've got one coming out within the next, I don't know, 12 months or so. <laughs> coaching Salespeople and the Sales Champions, great book. Um, read about coaching, that's what I did. Um, use the drip method outlined in this presentation to implement it. I've actually got a coaching recruitment letter, the one that I used to roll it out at my dealership, and I'm happy to share that with you guys if it's something you'd wanna roll out at yours. Number three, hire a coach. Seriously, hire a coach. And if you're going to hire a coach, then you should certainly think about hiring one that's, you know, been number one in the region and every month and was the only <laughs> coach up on this job. I had to, Jerry. That's just a joke. Uh, you know, only store up in a down market. Joking. But, but seriously, and, but for me, honestly, it's not about what I did. It's about what they do. As a coach, my success, and, and this goes for managers as well, you're, you're, not, you're not tied to your own success here. As a leader, you're tied to the success of others. All right? So for me, when you make someone else have a record month, when you make a salesperson move up in their organization, or you, you help someone change someone's life for the better, now you're doing your job as a leader, and you can accomplish that through coaching for no matter who they are, how long they've been in the business, um, it doesn't matter. So one thing, remember I said in the beginning, I said, oh, it's hard to find good people, right? Guys, stop looking for good people, all right? If you're a manager, you, you guys, you already have good people. They're on your showroom floor. It's up to you to develop them. It's that simple, all right, guys? This is Sean Kelly, the Carpets Coach. Thank you guys very much.
appreciate you. It's an honor to be up here. And here's contact information. You guys feel free to text me or email me at any time. Will you make it available to come to the deck? Absolutely, so, 100%. Uh, hopefully we're connected with uh, LinkedIn with Sean. So first of all, again, huge, you came out from St. Louis. No big deal, I'll do it, I'll do it anytime. I'll steal that, yeah. We're gonna have to go crying game on them. <laughs> Well, you can't come up here for a second. Let, 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 let's chat for a second. Okay. So we got one mic, so we're going to share it. Um, quick question. Half the room is salespeople, right? Confirm? Yeah, everyone put their hands up who are salespeople? Okay. So the salespeople who want to improve and they find that they're trapped, they're not getting the engagement, what would you, what would you recommend? Um, the salespeople aren't getting the engagement. They, they, no. they say their management From aren't as, as engaged as, they, as you would be. So you can, co you can coach up, okay? And, and I had to, oh dear Lord, I had to coach up to my dealer principal many, many times and my manager. So go to your manager and, and say, hey, by the way, what does your boss want, want most? No different, right? If your boss wants to hit number one in the region, hey manager, hey boss, I wanna help us hit number one in the region and I have some ideas to talk about doing that. When's a good time to sit down and talk about it? That's cool. Recruit them to the conversation. And, and for the people who are in a situation where you say, you know what, I want to do better. I want to be better. And maybe your management, uh, they're probably awesome people, but they may have not had the coaching themselves. A lot of people in the industry, would you agree? Good salesperson themselves, but probably not a people person. You know, <laughs> going through everyone's drawers in the morning looking for leads. Um, there's a lot of resources out, out, out online. There's a lot of, I learned how to sell cars through watching YouTube and, and Joe Verde and a lot, but with, uh, with the guys in the room, uh, with your network, ask. All you have to do is reach out. I guarantee you 99% of people will be willing to help you if you just ask, even if you're competitors in direct market. We all want to succeed, would you agree? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think that there are so many resources out there that go overlooked, like uh, Facebook groups, like we've got a Facebook group, there's about 900 people in there, half of them are salespeople. Um, half of them are managers, BDC managers, everyone. But uh, yeah, I mean, joining a, a group, uh, reaching out, like if I, po I post stuff on LinkedIn all the time, hey, I need help here. Uh, that's how I met JP, at, literally uh, through LinkedIn. Yeah. And he gave me some advice on something I asked. Literally, I was like, hey, I ran out, of, I don't know what it was, but it, you helped me. <laughs> Whatever it was, but that's how we met, was on LinkedIn. Yeah, and, and, and for managers out there, if you wanna get a really good idea of, of how your, uh, your staff are doing, ask them to do a self-assessment. Write some questions and hand it out and ask them to be honest. And then what, you know, take your, what you think is right, let them answer. Because a lot of times salespeople will be really honest with where their limitations are and where their strengths are, right? There, there's, uh, so there's only three reasons why someone won't do what they need to do to succeed, okay? And this goes for you as a salesperson, it goes for your managers, um, literally only three reasons. One of them is you're fearful of a negative result or reaction. You know what I mean? Like if I'm scared to go to my boss, probably not gonna be able to go to them, right? Um, another one is, um, is I don't know how to do it. If I don't have the ability, then that's gonna hold us back. And then the third is I don't see value in it. You know, it's, and, and that goes back to the bad internet. Why would someone say there's bad internet leads? Quite simply because they, they, their ability, the way they were using them, they didn't generate results. So then they developed this belief that internet leads are bad, right? And that is the, that's the challenge. So yeah. if someone won't, if your manager won't coach you, if you have a challenge, if something's holding you back, just ask yourself, is it because I'm fearful? Do I not see value in it? Or do I just not know how? And that can help kind of direct you. Yeah. And Warren uh, is on Haggle.com, by the way. He does leads. Oh, okay. That's awesome. all he does. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. um, well, so again, not a huge round. Thank you so much. Hey, thank, um, thank you. Uh, We're going to break for another 10 minutes. And just so... Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have a ladies specific washroom here by Serena Williams, uh, and around the corner is the men's specific washroom, private washroom. And if you look in the wall, uh, St. Clair's hand is on Gordy House bum. Just figure it out. It's the only one. So, um, for those who want extra help and are not getting at the dealership and don't know who to ask, you've got a room full of knowledge here. Uh, you've got Jason Harris, of course. Uh, you've got Rob Gao, he does AIM training. You've got Sean, you've got Barry, you've got myself. Reach out, we're happy to help. All we want to do is see you succeed. And that's why we hold these events. That's why Jason holds these events. So you guys can grow and ladies can grow, please. So uh, grab some drinks, let's take about 10, 10 minute break and we'll move on to Jason. Thanks a lot.
they need more drink tickets this time. Okay, that's cool. Can you give me a water real quick? A water? Please. Oh, just a bottle, it's fine. I'll grab a scotch later. Start with that guy up there. <laughs> you like my hot dog guy? Oh, yeah, okay, okay, okay. Let me do this. Ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay, ready? Once upon a time. I know, actually, the new version of it does. It's, yeah. Everybody, <laughs> the shoes uh, on orange. Let's grab your seats again. We're going to our I'll feature next presentation. <laughs> you. I can talk to your boob. You can talk to my boob. Hello. <laughs> you know, we're live right now. I know. Okay. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. <laughs> oh, no. What is that? What is that? Duck. <laughs> oh, it's, it's PG <laughs> in Japan. There's nothing PG, <laughs> nothing PG about this guy. So, um, <laughs> I want to take our seats up a bit closer. Come on, in, guys. Run, 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 run. <laughs> so, um, y'all know that I was a former comedian, but I was also a strip club announcer for a couple weeks. Uh, that's how you get this beautiful voice. So every time Jason speaks, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I, he, he likes to uh, be announced. Uh, I guess he is the old days when he was a little more limber. Yeah. Uh, limber. On the <laughs> he wanted to be announced like this. Ladies and gentlemen, the young and the and children of all ages, and for the millions viewing around the world, <laughs> please welcome to the stage, Mr. Jason <laughs> oh, <God>. Harris. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, now I, I gotta get the the blood from my face actually I'm gone for a moment here. Take it off. No, don't, please. The guy in the back's thinking that. Um, all right, hey guys, thank you so much for uh, coming out. It really means a lot to us. Um, my staff uh, spend so much time in putting to, putting this together, and, and let's get, just give them one more round of applause, guys. Thanks. <laughs> You know, we do these for the benefit of all of you guys. It, you know, I've been in your shoe, every single person in this room, I've probably spent some time in the position that you guys have been in. And it's such a passion for myself and for my team that we see every single one of you do better and exceed and grow within this amazing industry that we're in. We are so proud to be a part of this industry. And you guys should be so proud of that, of your industry as well. I think we should actually have one more round of applause just for our industry, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> 
Now today, guys, I get to talk to you about one of my favorite things, and that is branding. Uh, just so you guys know, this is the hot dog version of me. When I, uh, my, when I asked my team that I needed some type of digital mascot, this is how they see me. A little concerned that that's how they view me as a hot dog cylinder individual. I'm sure there's probably a lot to do with that. But anyways, um, today, today, guys, we're going to talk about um, branding. We're going to talk about the importance of it, the benefits, and then, of course, the content that goes behind branding. To get us started, branding exists in the mind of your customers. Now, a brand is not limited to the company that you guys work for. A brand is yourself, the company you work for, the manufacturer that you support, right? Brand exists all over the place. To understand that a brand is not something that you define, a brand is who is what the customer defines you to be. How would they describe you? That's what the brand is. Today, guys, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. It's gonna get started here. Um, which of these words, all right, would define your brand? All right, we all, we all want to be defined uh, by very specific words, either a transparency or innovation. Are you a fun brand? Is that something I can associate with myself, all right? Are you guys fun? Are you hassle-free? Do you make the experience easy for me? Are you passionate about what you do? Are you timely and are you professional? These are words that we want our customers to describe us as. If that's our goal and objective, then we need to be very aware of how we're putting content out there and what content we're putting out there to ensure that these are the words that our customers are using. Again, the Brand is not just defined to you as an individual, but also how the brand gets defined from your employees. As if you're an employee of a company right now, all right, how do you define the company that you're working for? You know, do you define the dealership that you're working for as fun? Is it a tyrancy? Is it, is it boring? All right. Owners of these companies need to understand that our employees and our customers define who we are as a brand. Now this, this next slide is an amazing example of a Canadian um, auto group that has done a phenomenal job of defining who they are as a brand and using that information to attract new employees. So we're going to take a minute and watch this video. It's go time. Sir, I'd like to be considered for the position of finance manager. Yeah, this guy gets it. Who's this? I don't know. You promised me I'd get promoted. Goodbye. Nice try, Barry. <laughs> Matt. You're such a loser, Barry. <laughs> Stop laughing. Mom and Dad embarrassed of your career? Welcome <laughs> to the Go Auto Revolution, Toronto. Yeah. You get what you pay for. Follow me. <laughs> Is it true that Go Auto is one of Canada's largest dealer groups with over 10,000 vehicles in over 40 locations? Yes. Does that impress you? Probably not, you cynical <laughs> Maybe this will. <laughs> <laughs> We're hiring. Our promote from within culture means we don't do jobs, we do careers. Isn't that right, Greg? Can't talk, make your money. <laughs> Greg used to mop floors. Now he's mopping up sales. Still not impressed? <laughs> All Go Auto employees receive great benefits. And profit from the employee investment program. You like money? Our customer loyalty program and in-house financing means all of our sales associates close more deals than this guy. <laughs> Speaking of sales, I want to introduce you to our newest sales associate. We don't sell cars, we sell brains. <laughs> I don't know if you guys heard that last part. They don't sell cars, they sell dreams. All right, what, what just an amazing example of defining who the company is as a brand in the eyes of their employees and using that to attract new talent. Uh, what just uh, really, really an amazing job, guys. Now I probably I'm gonna get a couple comments about this afterwards. But Jason, were you pushing Go Auto at your place? No, no, I wasn't pushing Go Auto, but what an amazing job of really executing on that. All right, guys, let's talk about the importance of having a brand. 
I believe all you guys know that I am pretty passionate about the color orange. <laughs> you know, I would love to tell you that the orange tie and the orange shoes ha has this amazing story and that I was sitting in an office with a group of my staff and we came up with this phenomenal idea how I was going to wear orange every single day I came into work, but that'd be a lie. It actually wasn't true at all. All right, uh, the very first business card we ever created, I asked a graphic designer to create us a design. The first design he created was an orange background, uh, orange and black background. That was a design. Orange just kind of stuck. But for the first year, it wasn't necessarily a part of our brand. It wasn't until I had gone to a big trade show. One day I decided to wear an orange tie, found these amazing orange shoes at a local uh, shoe store. By the way, they're Vans. Van, I don't know, you guys, anybody else wear Vans right now? Like, t talk about a brand that just all of a sudden just kind of came back. Like, I remember bands were like really, really cool, you know, when I was a kid, and then it seemed like they disappeared, but all of a sudden they're, they're coming back. Well, congratulations, Vans, you make orange shoes, and I really love orange shoes. So uh, I wore orange shoes, I wore an orange tie to this conference, and almost instantaneously, uh, the amount of response I was getting was like, that was so cool. And then, of course, all of our sales sheets at the time and our business cards had the color orange along with them. In fact, at the exact same conference, so the first time I've ever worn both the orange tie and the orange shoes, someone stopped me and said, hey, I, I know you from somewhere. And I'm like, okay, well, let's try to figure this out. Uh, sure enough, about 12 months prior to that, I actually tried to pitch him on working with us, and he couldn't remember my name or my face, and there was no way I was going to remember him, because at the time, he was about 145 pounds heavier, so there's no way I was going to remember him. But um, he sure in the heck remembered the orange. He remembered the orange cell sheet sitting on his desk. And he had instantaneously associated my orange tie, my orange shoes with those orange uh, sell sheets. And it's become a big part of uh, our business. Consistent branding increases revenue by up to 23%. For most corporations, I'll tell you right now, for me, it's closer to about 80%. The consistency in our branding efforts through all the content that we put out there, all right, and me going from every single dealership I've ever been in wearing my orange tie and my orange shoes has increased our revenue by 80%. You and the dealerships you guys work at can all find that type of branding element. Actually, there's a lot of salespeople out there who do a phenomenal job of that. We have one sitting in here. We have a couple actually sitting in here. They're doing a great job of creating that brand and defining who they are. 10 seconds. 10 seconds is what you get. That's all you get, all right? 10 seconds impression is what you get from a customer to define who you are as a brand, all right, and what your brand is about. Okay? You, need to, you need to ensure that that brand is something that you're consistent with every single day. You're consistent with every single piece of content that you put out there. 10 seconds is what it takes for someone to acknowledge that, oh, you're associated with this type of brand. Brand needs to be seamless to the user experience. Right? What I mean by that is that if a customer is expecting an experience online, that experience online needs to be seamless to the in-dealership experience, which needs to be seamless to the after-sales experience, right? If these experiences are not seamless, it will actually immediately discredit your brand. Again, all coming down to consistency. 73% of consumers love a brand because of great customer service. So something that they're open about. Customer service is a huge part of brand loyalty. Now guys, it's not one thing. It's just, it's one thing to say that customer service is a part of your brand. It's a whole nother thing to show that. And we're gonna talk about that as we start developing out content, right? You can't just say you're in customer service. You need to show that you're in customer service. And you do that through your consistency of efforts, but also documenting those efforts through content. Loyalty equals transparency, or even kind of the other way around. Transparency can actually equal loyalty as well. All right, 94% of consumers are more likely to be loyal to a brand when a commitment of full transparency is made. So transparency is a huge part of brands that we're currently a part of. You guys think of, you know, each one of you have brands that you guys are currently committed to right now. Now this could be clothing brands, this could be car automotive brands, this could be hotel brands or uh, video game brands, but these are ones that you're always consistently going to because of the transparency and that seamless experience that they give you. How familiar is your brand? 59% of consumers prefer to purchase from a familiar brand. Creating familiarity in your brand 
again, comes back to the consistency in your guys' efforts, right? For me to be familiar with your brand, I need to have frequency and you guys consistently sharing the exact same message. Define what those words are for you. Who in this room would say um, your brand is defined by transparency? Would you guys say that's a part of what you do when you're selling a car or selling a product or service? Transparency is part of it, right? Who in here don't believe in customer service? <laughs> Who in here does believe in customer service? Do your customers describe you as that? If you were to go back right now and ask the last five people that you sold a car to, give me three words that would describe myself and the experience you had with them. Would transparency be one of those words? Would customer service be one of those words? If the answer is yes, guys, you're, doing, you're on the right track here. Okay? If you're not 100% sure, you need to take a moment. All right? How are people viewing me? Frequency. It takes five to seven impressions to produce just a smidge, just a smidge of brand awareness. Uh, how many of you guys in here follow me on LinkedIn? Cool, all right. I don't know if you guys know lately, but we've actually ramped up the amount of content we put out on a pretty regular basis. Our current goal right now is in an eight hour normal shift day or work day that we're putting out a fresh piece of content every single hour that you guys are working on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Three different marketing channels, all right. One piece of content every single hour. How often do you guys open up your phones and not your, my face is one of the first things you guys see when you open up LinkedIn? <laughs> you said that in a negative way. Oh, no, it's like, it's just, <laughs> Rob, what you got? Jason, can there be too much content? Is there, is there a threshold? Is there a threshold? You know what it is? If the content is self-promoting, 100%. All right? uh, for example, guys, I, I've looked at so many dealerships' social media efforts. And dealerships, well, A, they're the most anti-social social media people in the world. But the amount of self-promoting that goes on in their content is just astronomical. Look at me. Look how happy I make my customers. Look how amazing our deals are. You guys got to understand that when you're putting content out there, you're putting out for the value of the people that are going to be consuming it, not for yourself. Right? I want people to, my brand, I want people to define my brand as knowledgeable, passionate and fun. And hopefully those are maybe a few of the words you guys think of when you think of me as a brand, okay? Exact same thing goes for you. If that content is about the other person, or is, if that content is in the benefit of someone else and not in yourself, then the amount of content that you put out there, you literally, I could probably bump my content twice as much and there would still be some value in it. Guys, understand, do it for the customer. In return, they'll do it for you. But you got to take the first step forward. Any other questions on frequency? That was a great question. Thank you, Ralph. OK. Retention. How many of you guys um, in sales right now are real focused on your retention and your referral business? Some of you guys are? All right. Well, we're going to have to get some of you guys on the bandwagon of retention. Okay. A 2% increase in customer retention can lower your customer acquisition cost by over 20%. Okay? Now, I'm using cost kind of in a very loose term here. Okay? I don't necessarily mean dollars. It can mean dollars, all right? but I'm also talking cost in the sense of time. All right? What is the most, uh, what the most valuable commodity right now out there is time. Okay? You focusing on increasing your retention will lower the amount of time you have to put into right, your sales funnel. Does that make sense? That, does that make sense to everyone here that's, that's in charge of sales or they're a salesperson themselves? OK. All right, now let's get into content, because we know we love talking about content, right? Well, at least I like talking about content. I'm going to wait if anybody notices. Okay, I got a giggle in the back. Okay. <laughs> you guys were sitting here waiting for something to play here, right? Okay. 20% of people will read, will read the text on a page, but 80% of people will watch a video. 
<laughs> so if you're reading this, you're in the minority. If you guys think about the content you're going to put out there, the words are not nearly as important as the video. From a brand perspective, I need to see you as an individual. All right. Four times as many customers would rather watch a video about a product than read about it. When you guys are sending emails out to customers, are you sending out long drawn emails about how amazing the product is? Or are you guys sending out a great video about how amazing the product is? Uh, raise your hands, actually, I'm really kind of curious. How many people right now are using video in their email responses? All smart people. All, <laughs> so, okay. We got a few people, guys, something to think about, okay? If your dealership doesn't already have a tool like this, these tools are very inexpensive for you to purchase and utilize yourself, okay? Um, that video is going to mean so much more to the customer than you guys writing out any type of text. Any questions about that before I move on? Okay. This is data pulled from many different sources, both in Canada and U.S. 50% <laughs> of people follow one to four brands on social media. Actually, I'm kind of curious. Uh, how many people right now, uh, just one brand, how many people are following one brand on social media right now? Okay. How many people are following two brands on social media? Three brands? Four brands. Wow, okay. So some of these brands probably have some work for you cut out. <laughs> uh, clearly the ones that you're following are bringing you value, hence the reason why you continue to follow them, right? Our goal, guys, for you as individuals, both as salespeople and dealerships, is that you guys become that brand that I want to follow. Why would I want to follow you? The product and service that you sell is not the reason I want to follow you. You need to bring more value to the table than the value of the product or service you sell. Does that make sense for everyone? Okay. Custom content over generic content. 78% find companies uh, that focus on custom content are more trustworthy than ones that use generic content. This is great for anybody. Anybody in here in charge of their dealership's website? Okay, I got a couple people in here. Okay, that's perfect. All right. The content that you put on your website, if it's literally regurgitating what the manufacturer has already said, the value, the perception to the consumer is that's not as trustworthy as you actually writing the content itself. They want to hear your voice. They've already heard somebody else's voice. All right. Their perception is that you're just not willing to take the time to actually write out that information or create the video of that information. Authentic content wins. I have uh, Paul the Dodge father in here. <laughs> Paul, uh, Paul and his uh, partner Justin do an amazing job of putting out very authentic content. If you guys have not had an opportunity to watch Friday Night Fights with Paul and Justin, they are incredible incredibly entertaining and insanely authentic, okay? Paul, if you guys haven't got a chance, buy a drink from Paul afterwards and he'll tell you everything, all right? And you, you'll hear him from about half a mile away as well, okay? Paul just has this just big, bold presence and the way that he describes a vehicle is nowhere close to how Justin would describe a vehicle, all right? Paul's a hammer, Justin's a scalpel, all right? Justin loves the technology. All right, and appreciates the little nuances all right, of the vehicles. And on Friday night fights, this is what Justin brings to the table. And then Paul comes in, like a bull in a china shop. <laughs> but the banter that goes on between the two of them when they're fighting back and forth about the difference between the vehicles that they brought to the table is insanely authentic and has done amazing things as far as engagement. And you correct me if I'm wrong, but has developed out a sales funnel for you that is just constantly dripping new leads into it on a regular basis, right? It's what I think originally started as just a good idea, all right, quickly molded into just this very, very authentic approach to talking about used vehicles that customers now are, are coming to on a regular basis. Every Friday they do it. They're looking for that next Friday night fight. It's both educate and entertain, and Paul and Justin bring both. I'll let you guys figure out which one's which. 
educate, entertain. <laughs> All right, but it's through that authentic content that I'm able to a, uh, relate with them, not only at a personal level, but then also get appreciation for what they're doing as a brand and continue to follow them. You guys have followers, people that are consistently commenting and watching the videos and just looking for that next one. They're requesting them, they're even requesting them, right? Have you guys put this car to this car? What was the last one you did? You guys did really good, was it the jalopy one? The scrap, scrap dish, all right? They took literally the two worst cars that they had in, the, uh, in, in their trade-ins. I think at one point in time, of course, Paul, in Paul's typical way, goes in for the handle and literally just rips the handle right off the car. <laughs> um, but it's just, it's, it's educating, it's entertaining, it's so authentic that consumers are able to watch this and go, oh, these guys are fun. I mean, this is a brand I want to associate myself with. If I'm going to buy a vehicle and I'm in the London area, all right, I want to buy a vehicle from these guys. And they're just having fun from a very authentic place. Organic content has 10 times more conversion lead rate than paid content. I know a bunch of guys might be thinking, oh, wait a second, Jason, don't you run a marketing agency? And yes, I do, okay? Paid, con paid content, all right, has a tremendous amount of volume, value, all right? But or organic content is where it's at. Now, how do we use paid to help support our organic, our organic strategies? Um, I have a dealership that produced a video uh, for a Jeep Wrangler, and it was about how to install their windshield wiper fluid, their windshield uh, wiper inserts, okay? We put that video, we put that video together. It was a really kind of half-assed, poorly done video, but we, we put it together and we threw it out there. We, we, we put a couple hundred bucks behind it, as far as paid goes, just to see if anybody gave a crap about this particular message. Sure enough, it took us less than 30 days to go, wow, there's a lot of people out there that are very much so interested on how to insert properly the windshield wiper inserts on a Jeep Wrangler, because I guess supposedly it's really difficult. Does anybody in here write, uh, own a Jeep Wrangler? Anyone? Okay, good, so I can pick on Jeeps, cool. Um, <laughs> he's smiling over because he loves Jeeps. <laughs> he loves, um, but this video did so well, we decided to turn it into an organic piece. And the organic piece was supported by blogs, it was supported by website content, it was supported by another couple of series of videos. To date, there have been over 100,000 organic views of how to install wiper blades on your Jeep Wrangler. And the engagement that they've got to that and the amount of people that they've been able to suck into their website and support that funnel and start to build out that funnel has just been gigantic for them. So much so that we don't actually even at this point have to continue to pay to push Jeeps. We're bringing so many people organically in through the funnel with content. Uh, anybody uh, have an audience in their dealership uh, ages between 55 and 65? Yeah, everyone's selling cars right now to this audience, okay? All right, here's an interesting thing with that audience. Um, branded content on social media is twice as likely to interest people at the ages of 55 to 65 than uh, who are 28 and younger. Okay, branded content. You think brands are really important to us as millennials? Sure it is. But you know, we keep saying that it's incredibly important to millennials, but in reality, it's even more so important to that age group of 55 to 65, okay? You guys need to create your own brand and create content around that brand. Blogs, anybody right now doing a blog? Any, anybody doing, cool. Anybody doing a vlog? Cool. Why not? Why not? I, I, I'm sorry, guys. I'm going to get a little, you know, slap you in the face right now. But what the hell are you doing? Okay. In a typical eight-hour shift on a sales floor, roughly about only two hours at eight-hour shift, are you actually in front of a customer, face to face? That is six hours of your time. You guys can be doing something. What do you guys think you should be doing? <laughs> Creating a brand <laughs> and following up. Yes. Blogs increase leads by 67%, okay? It, how easy would it be right now for you guys to go back to your dealership, all right, identify, let's say, the top 10 questions you guys get asked 
all the time as salespeople or sales managers or dealer principals. What are those top 10 questions you get asked all the time? There you go. That's a great one. All right. Any other questions? What would be some of those top 10 questions? What's the best price? There you go. What's my trade worth? Look, these are people, these are questions that have significant value to the customer. But you guys aren't answering them. If you guys can answer that information to me in the form of a blog, all right, that now allows me to digest how you answer that question. Are you answering that question in a professional way? Is it a fun and entertaining way? I know how Paul's going to answer the question. All right? But Dennis, how are you going to answer that question? It's going to be entirely different, right? You need to know how you guys are going to define this information and put this information out there. All right? Blogs are going to increase your leads by 67%. Quick, quick question. How many of you guys believe that it's your dealership's responsibility to provide you leads? I know some of you guys don't actually want me to answer because you know I'm going to pick on you. <laughs> All right. Well, if you think it is, I'm going to tell you right now, it's not. Okay? It is not your dealership's responsibility to provide you leads. Will they provide you some? Absolutely. But you're a sales professional. Professional being the key word here. Right? You guys need to be developing your own leads. Take the time to create the content that has value to somebody else and start creating and developing out those relationships and turn those bad boys into leads. Don't sit there staring out the window. Has anybody ever seen the Badger commercials? How many people in here have seen the Badger commercials? All right, a bunch of people, All right? My, my favorite one is him sitting out the window and it's raining outside. Mm, gonna get me one today. You know, and it's just, it's, and that's, that's just the whole time. It's just, and, and I know we're laughing about this and it's funny. I, I, I can't tell you how many dealerships I've been in all right, where I see salespeople literally fogging up the glass, the front of the dealership, just going, well, when is that up bus showing up? Because it's going to be any time now. I got eight hours. <laughs> Bottom line, guys, take those 10 questions. You guys take them back. You guys answer them in the form of a blog and a vlog. All right. Now, now, now I know you're saying, that, well, Jason, you know, so many people are, sorry, go ahead, Matt. Okay, a video blog. <laughs> so yeah, so a blog is going to be in the written text, right? Now, why are we going to write that into text? Well, because that's what search engines want to look for. Okay, they want to see that text so they know exactly what this page is about. All right, the vlog, the video portion of that page, is going to be how someone wants to consume it. Right? Eighty percent of customers want to consume video before they consume text. Okay. Now, all of you guys signed up for this event, so that means I have the profile and email address for every single one of you. My team and I will be checking on this to make sure you do this. No, I'm just kidding, we won't. Or will we? <laughs> all right, companies with blogs produce, well, because we already kind of talked about it, 67% more. All right, too much self-promotion is very bad. I'll just simplify that for you, right? 45% of people surveyed said they would unfollow a brand on social media if they dominantly put too much self-promoting in there. Does everybody understand what self-promoting is? Pictures, comments about how absolutely amazing you are. Okay. That's, not, I can't, that's not something I can buy into. Right. You guys need to give me something that I can buy into. Right. What is your brand? How many people in here would define their brand as fun? Raise, raise your hands. Anybody? I know you, you're fun, right? Okay. How many people define their brand as uh, transparent? Okay. That's how we want to be defined as. It doesn't necessarily mean that's how our customer are defining us as. These are the questions you need to ask yourself. This is the process you guys need to take to start developing out your own personal brand. And now let's talk about the benefits, okay? So we talked about the importance of branding. We talked about the content of branding. Now we're going to talk about the benefits of branding. Now afterwards, you know, if you want to grab Paul you know, off to the side, he can tell you a lot about 
the benefits of branding. He's physically seen it in dollar signs on his paycheck. You guys need to be doing the same. No referrals for bad mobile sites. Anybody in here that's responsible for your dealership's website? I'll tell you right now, 50% of all mobile users will not recommend a business if their mobile website is poorly designed or unresponsive. Hey, you guys, actually, Barry is so insanely familiar about this. All right. uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but Barry actually, well, you were the first, weren't you, in the automotive sector? We're within the first. Yeah, within the, the first handful of people that were putting out fully responsive websites, and that was back when? 2010. <laughs> Guys, 2010. I, I can't tell you today how many websites I see are still not responsive websites. There are huge players in our industry right now. I mean, we're talking monster, monster players in the automotive website space that still do not provide a responsive design. Okay? But that's okay for you as individuals, because guess what? Your website's going to be, right? And I always say your website, all right? If you guys not had an opportunity, here's my little plug. I want you guys to check out strategywithjason.com. That is my brand, my website. Every single one of you need to have your brand and your website. Do not expect your dealership to do this for you, because they're not. Look, as your sales professionals, right? Where you're selling, that's and that's just where you're hanging your hat right now. Now, hopefully you'll hang your hat there for a long period of time, okay? But do not build a career out of someone else's brand's efforts. Build your, your career out of your own brand. Organic frequency produces higher clicks. 50% of people are more likely to click on a particular brand if that brand name shows up more than once in the search results, okay? This is, search results are so localized. You guys want to know what the most common search term now is on Google? Near me. It's insane how fast that term is being used. I don't know if you guys have searched for anything in Google lately. Almost, I mean, you'd be a few words into it and then it will literally finish the sentence for you, near me, okay? You putting out your 10 questions, putting out that content out there, all right? When someone's asking that question, you showing up, your website, okay, your website, your website or your dealership's website showing up multiple times in that search function instantaneously tells that, that consumer that there's a significant brand. They're, they're looking at this. How many times do this, does this name pop up in this particular search? Yep. Yes. I got five. Good thing it's my show. <laughs> it's my show. That's cool, guys. I only got one more after this, too. Um. <laughs> guys, any questions about branding? Yes? Incredibly consistent. I wore the same tie for two years. Not the same tie. I have nine, different, I have nine of these ties, by the way. <laughs> Vlogs? Talking about frequency, right? Look, at the end of the day, guys, um, when coming to building content, and me and Paul have sat down and had a lot of discussions about this, it's about creating a routine, right? Um, I just recently signed up for the gym. Anybody else? Am I the only person here? Okay, thank good. Okay, I got, you know, a good 15, I wanna lose a good 15, 20 pounds I'd like to use, I'd like to lose, right? Uh, well, <laughs> here's what I did. First three weeks, Two, two, twice a week, religiously, boom, every single time. Third, fourth week came around, ah, oh, man, it's a game changer week. Ah, uh, you know, the kids are really kind of cranky right now. I don't know if I'll take them. Uh, and, and, and I started to fall, immediately start falling out of my routine, right? The, the key to content is being consistent in those efforts. So you want to commit to a routine that you feel comfortable that you can actually execute. Look, an idea is only as good as how well we can execute it, right? You know, for, um, it's funny, because I asked him uh, how, how Paul and Justin came up with Friday Night Fights. And the answer was, well, that's when the two of them were working together. 
That's, that's what it was. Both of them were on shift at the exact same time. Sorry, what's the other one? It's Wednesday. It's Wrangler Wednesday. Wednesday. Yes. Again, it was when Paul and Justin were on shift. The cool thing is the two of them doing this together created kind of this, um, well, they, they worked off each other. They pushed each other to make the content, right? I mean, how many, t how many days did you not want to go out there and shoot the video, but Justin pushed you to shoot the video? And, and, and how many of those days were you prepped and ready to shoot the video, but Justin was a little tired and bushy, right? right? You want to find something that's going to hold you accountable, all right? I kind of think of it like the personal trainer, all right? For, for Justin and Paul, they're, they're each other's best personal trainer, okay? If you don't have a Justin or Paul that you get to work with, um, your phone. The calendar is an amazing personal trainer, all right? Setting your calendar to when you're going to do this, committing to that time, physically setting up so it happens every single week at that time, and that notification does not turn off until you actually do it, in that sense, that can in itself just be your personal trainer. Any other questions about content? Branding? Yes, sir. Uh, what do you mean by responsive mobile websites? Okay, cool. Actually, Barry would be the one that really, really good to answer this, but right now what it is for some website platforms, they have the desktop version, then they have the mobile version, okay? And the two are not identical, meaning there's not a seamless structure between the two, okay? On a responsive one, when I, what I, the experience I get on the desktop will literally just respond down to a, mo a smaller device. Was that a decent way of explaining it? It's all about user experience at the end of the day. Guys, any other questions about branding or content? No? Okay. Yes. What about some of the best practices for sharing on, you know, JP and I were talking earlier how if you share someone's LinkedIn thing, it can diminish your algorithm and things. You know, and if you, I know if you take a YouTube link and put it on, like, Facebook, it doesn't get a lot of notifications, right? Whereas going live gets people more. Can you share some of those for these guys that do post a lot of content? Okay. So, Okay, so there's a lot of different formats to utilize when one executing on the content itself, right? Um, right now, each social plat uh, platform will reward you based on the current format that they're putting out there, okay? So for the fact, um, I don't know if you guys know, but LinkedIn is gonna be launching their live video format. In fact, actually, some people have already started to get access to that, okay? What's gonna happen for a period of time, not forever, but for a period of time, anybody that's actively using that type of format, all right, their, that social media algorithm is going to push that content farther up. Same thing with Instagram right now, all right? For the longest time, Instagram organic was amazing, or, and Facebook organic was absolutely amazing, okay? But as the, as the platforms continue to grow and continue to adapt, you guys should be aware of what formats, what new content formats are coming out, and you guys should be testing and playing with those. You'll see the benefit, incremental benefit, of trying out new formats like that. And, and to uh, Sean's question, contents, uh, social media and LinkedIn and things like that, they don't want you to share. They want you to kind of give a, a, a worship or, or give a testimonial to something. If you just create a, a, a secondary contact or a secondary image of it, of the content, it, it kind of goes, nah, that's two of them, I don't need that. So if you, if you create Because it's a, looking for original content. It's looking for original content. So make a post, if you want to share someone's post, make a, uh, oh, like a, a uh, testimonial. This was a great post, I, want, I wanted to give it, and then give the link. Don't just hit share and do it, because that actually actually knocks it down the list. Right? Yeah, if, if you guys, I mean, look, you guys are out there consuming content yourselves, right? And you might find some value in a piece of content that you would love to share with your current audience, right? Uh, just hitting the share button is not, and that's what we're talking about here, it's not the best strategy, 
all right, uh, writing out a few sentences, or even just quickly capturing a video of yourself talking about that specific piece of content, and then tagging that content in the comments below, that will actually enhance and engage a lot better. You've, you've all seen the, the video of the, the, uh, the customer experience, the, the guy in the restaurant, probably now on LinkedIn, he's done about 80 times around. The guy in the restaurant's like, uh, we don't, th we could have made this uh, at home. Uh, we don't think we're gonna pay for this. It's been around about 80 times. Well, every time it gets reshared, it actually takes that person because it's been out 80 times. Whoever just reshared it actually knocks them down in, in the algorithm, right? So it's better off say, hey, I find a really cool video and then embed the link because then it's a re original content like yep. Jason was saying. All right? It's all about original content at the end of the day. You guys, these are great questions. Hey, uh, here's what's going to happen next. We are going to have to, uh, unfortunately, grab some more drinks. <laughs> um, we're going to have to step out of the room for a little bit while they uh, reconstruct the room for us for dinner so we can watch the baseball game. And, guys, let's keep this momentum going. You know, connect with everyone next to yourselves. You guys have done the LinkedIn thing, so that's perfect. All right, let's keep the networking going. Let's have some fun tonight, guys. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. So <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to, uh, first of all, uh, thank Sean for coming all the way from St. Louis. Uh, first time in Canada. It's awesome. Barry, thank you. You're, I know your schedule is very limited, so I really appreciate, appreciate that. Um, the BART staff. <laughs> Gotta love our BART staff. <laughs> Tip your server. <laughs> Doesn't make enough. Tip your server. Um, and of course, the crew. So again, everybody to the cameraman, the Mario, everything else, and, uh, and Jason, as always. Thanks, man. And a blast, guys. Thanks, guys. We'll see you All back. Right. So we'll clear out. See you back in about, we'll call you in about 45 minutes. Gra grab a snack, grab a drink, and we'll meet you outside. Yeah, guys, so you can take them into the lobby. So it's totally cool. I highly recommend the Pilates. What are those fries? Pilates? What do you call them? Oh, the Pilates. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Pilates. The, the, I highly recommend those. Yeah, yeah, it's good. The boot team. <laughs> you were telling me that today. I was like, what is he talking about?